Love can be found anywhere. It can be found in weird places and weird circumstances. This is a story that talks about how true love was found in an unusual circumstance. An emergency phone call that was made to solve a very important issue led to a great love story. Daniel is a respected police officer. He does his work diligently. He has received several recognitions from a lot of government agencies for standing firm in trail periods. He has led many successful operations. Daniel joined the police force because of his father. His father was a police officer too. But he retired before Daniel joined the force. Daniel chose to join the police force because of the stories of different operations he heard from his father. During weekends when Daniel's father is at home. He usually tells him about dangerous operations they went. All these stories and the love Daniel had for the United States made him decide to join the United States Police Force. When Daniel graduated from high school, his father was still in service. He usually follows his father to the office once in a while because his father was a senior police officer. From there, he started knowing little things about the police force. He followed his father to the office one Sunday morning. Unfortunately, gunmen attacked their base. The policemen were able to overpower the gunmen, but they lost some officers. Daniel's father was very sad that day because he has just been promoted as the head of that base. When they got home, Daniel's father explained to him about the dangers involved in joining the police. He asked him if he saw the casualty they recorded when the gunmen invaded their base. Daniel replied in the affirmative. He said it happens almost every day. He said policemen die in the course of carrying out their duty every day. He said he was telling him that to know what he wants to get into. One year after Daniel graduated from high school, he got admission into Miami College. One day, some gunmen invaded their campus. Daniel joined the security men in overpowering the gunmen. From then on, people began to notice him in college. The head of security in the college personally invited Daniel to the school's security guard. Every Saturday and Sunday, Daniel usually joins the security guard in their training. After four years, Daniel graduated from college. As soon as Daniel graduated from college, he joined the police force. Fortunately, his first posting was to his father's base. But unfortunately, his father retired two months before he was posted. Daniel was happy that he was able to fulfill his dream of becoming a police officer. He carried out his duties diligently without fear or favor. He was always ready to tackle the enemies of the state. Five months into Daniel's stay at his base, a beautiful female police officer was transferred to his base. On her arrival, she was brought to Daniel's office for briefing because he is her immediate boss. Because of Mary's hard work, she became Daniel's favorite officer. They did everything together. They went on deadly assignments together. As time passed by, they began to fall in love with each other but none of them was ready to make the first move. Months went by without any tangible approach from any of them. One day, Daniel went to the gym with his friend Tony. After the gym, Daniel told Tony about Mary. He told him how he cannot stop thinking about Mary. He said he is afraid to share his feelings with Mary because of two things. He said the first is that, if Mary accepts to date him, it might impact negatively on their work. He said his love for her can interfere negatively in their job to the extent of giving her preferential treatment over others. He said the second reason is that, if Mary does not accept to date him, she might start disrespecting him. She might not give him the respect she used to give him before. Tony told Daniel that love supersedes everything he is thinking about. He said if he likes Mary, he should do the needful before another man snatches her away from him. After listening to Tony's advice, Daniel decided to take the bold step. He called Mary when he got home and asked her if she was free the next day. Mary told Daniel that she will be free the next day. He told her to meet him at the Miami resort the next day. Do you want me to do anything for you, sir? Mary asked. No, Daniel replied. He said there is an important thing he wants to tell her. Mary agreed to meet Daniel at the Miami resort the next day. When she dropped the call, she started thinking about why Daniel wanted to see her. In her mind, she started thinking if Daniel was ready to tell her what she has been craving to hear from him since the day she was posted to his base. On Sunday morning, Mary did her normal cycling exercise. After the exercise, she took breakfast. While she was eating her breakfast, 
she called Daniel to ask him the time they are to meet. Daniel gave her the honor of choosing the time she felt will be most comfortable for her. Mary said she thinks 12 is better. Daniel said he has no problem with the time she chose. After eating breakfast, Mary went to the bathroom and took a shower. At that time, the time was 8.30 a.m. She felt she had a lot of time because her house is just 30 minutes drive to the Miami resort. Not knowing what to do, Mary put on her television set and started watching a movie she bought. She has been watching the movie for more than a month. She has not been able to complete watching the movie because of her busy schedule at the office. She thought that, since she still has like two and a half hours before she leaves home, the best thing is for her to continue her movie from where she stopped. She loves the movie so much because the movie details the day-to-day -day job of a police officer. The movie was recommended to her by one of her colleagues. She watched the movie until 10.30 a.m. When she noticed that the time was 10.30 a.m., she switched off the television and went to the bathroom to take her bath. By 11.30 a.m., she has finished dressing and was ready to hit the road. By 12.05 a.m., she got to the Miami resort. At first, she didn't see Daniel so she had to call him. When Daniel answered the call, she asked him if he has arrived at the Miami resort. Daniel told her that he has been there for more than 30 minutes because he wanted to be there before her. She told him that he should come and pick her at the front of the resort because she cannot see him. Daniel rushed to the gate to pick Mary. They walked to where Daniel was sitting. Daniel ordered for a bottle of wine while Mary ordered preferred juice. For more than five minutes, Daniel did not say anything. He kept thinking if what he was about to do was the best. At some point, he wanted to change his mind. But he kept remembering what Tony told him. He didn't know how he will feel if he sees Mary with another man. Mary sat for five minutes and she didn't hear anything from Daniel. She asked him why he said he wanted to see her. She said she was surprised when he told her on phone to meet him at the Miami resort because she knows him as someone who likes staying indoor when he is not at work. Daniel told Mary that he has his reasons for telling her to meet him at the resort. He felt the resort was the best place to say it. He said he has been thinking about what he wants to tell her for months, but he thinks this is the right time for him to say it. He said everybody knows him in office as a disciplined man. He said they know him as someone who does not associate with the female gender at work or home. He said it has been like that since he was young. He said the reason for such is not that he doesn't like women, but since he was a child, he has never met a woman that was diligent as Mary. He said the first day he saw her in his office, he thought she was like other female officers who don't take their job seriously. But his perception changed when they went for an operation in Michigan. He said he was happy with the courage she displayed in the operation. He said aside that, he has been watching her closely at work. He said how she faces her job squarely. He said female police officers like Mary are rare in the police force. He said all these and many more are why he has decided to make the decision he is about to tell her. He said he doesn't know how she will accept what he was about to tell her but what he is about to tell her is nothing but the truth. What do you want to tell me? Mary asked. Daniel said he wants to tell her that he loves her and he will want to spend the rest of his life with her. Mary could not utter a word, even though it was what she wanted to hear. She didn't know her immediate boss could be this romantic. The look on Daniel's face showed he meant what he said. So it was not difficult for Mary to make her decision. Moreover, it was something she has been waiting to hear from him. Mary looked at Daniel in his face. She told him that she has been craving to hear what he just told her for months. Mary said she fell in love with Daniel the first day she stepped foot in the base. She said she has been hearing positive reviews about him before she was posted there. She said she heard more of his positive reviews when she entered the base the first day. She said policemen who take their work diligently like Daniel are rare. She urged him to continue to do more for the police force. After they had their rink, Daniel invited Mary to his house. Daniel drove in his car while Mary drove in her car. After 20 minutes of leaving the Miami resort, they arrived at Daniel's house. Daniel showed Mary around his house. He showed her all the awards he has won in the course of his service. He took her to his gym center and his swimming pool. After going round the rows, they finally settled down on the couch. Daniel and Mary continued their conversation. This time, their conversation changed from their work duties to a more intimate one. They talked about sex. Daniel asked Mary if she was comfortable with having sex on the first date. Mary said she doesn't think it is bad. At that point, Daniel knew what Mary said was an invite. 
He went very close to Mary and kissed her. It was as if Mary was waiting for the kiss. She kissed him and they started kissing passionately. While they were kissing, Daniel's hand was in Mary's boobs. He was fondling it while Mary was using her hand to romance his nipple. The moaning was so loud that they had to put on the television so that neighbors won't hear their moan. After kissing and romancing for some minutes, Daniel carried Mary to his bed. They had sex until they laid in the evening. After the sex, Daniel and Mary freshened up. Mary entered her car and left. After that day, their love became stronger. They continued to visit themselves often. Every visit was an avenue to have sex. Mary decided that they should keep their relationship away from their colleagues. Nobody in their office knew about their relationship. After six months of dating, Daniel decided to take the bold step. He decided to officially wed Mary. He decided that the first thing to do was to take Mary to his parents. On Friday, he called his parents and told them that he has a surprise package for them. He said they should prepare for him on Sunday. That Sunday morning, he told Mary to meet him at his house. When Mary arrived, they had quick sex like they usually do before they headed to Daniel's parents' house. When they got there, Daniel's parents were surprised to see him with a lady. They didn't know anything about her relationship before that day. He hugged his parents. He told them that the surprise package he has for them is Mary. He told them he and Mary are colleagues at work. He told his parents how he was made her immediate boss on the first day she was posted to his base. He told them how he was always thinking about her but didn't dare to approach her. He told them how Tony acted as the game changer. He told them how he finally summoned the courage to approach Mary after Tony told him to do the needful. He said their relationship has lasted for six months and he thinks this is the right time to finally tie the knot with Mary. Daniel's parents were very happy to hear that. They told Daniel that it is their joy to see their grandchild. They urged them to do the planning as fast as possible. They also told Daniel and Mary to carry them along in the planning. Daniel's mom prepared lunch for everyone. They ate to their satisfaction before taking their leave. While they were about to take their leave, Daniel's father asked his son if he has seen Mary's parents. He said he hasn't but they are planning to do that as soon as possible. Daniel's father said that was not good enough. He said he should see Mary's parents as soon as possible. Daniel joined Mary outside after he listened to his father. Mary was curious to know what kept Daniel back. So she asked him as soon as he joined her. Daniel said his father asked him if they have seen her parents. He said he told his father that they haven't but they are planning to do so. Daniel said his father urged him to do so as soon as possible. While they were driving home, he told Mary to call her parents on phone. He said she should inform them of their visit. He said she should ask them when they want him to come and see them. Mary put a call through to her dad. She told him that she wants to bring someone to him. She asked him when she should come and see him. Mary's father said he and her mother will be free on Saturday. He said she can come anytime on Saturday. With that, Daniel and Mary decided that they will see Mary's parents on Saturday. Mary slept at Daniel's house that day because she was very tired. They went to work together the next day. Their colleagues were surprised to see Mary coming down from Daniel's car. They decided to make their relationship public. So, they started going to work together. When people began to see them together, they knew something was happening between the two of them. On Saturday morning, Mary and Daniel made their way to Mary's parents' house. One hour after, they arrived there. They were welcomed by Mary's parents. They were surprised to see Daniel with Mary. They asked their daughter who Daniel is. She narrated to them how she met Daniel. She told them that Daniel is her immediate boss at work. She told her parents how Daniel has been a loving boss. She said he has moved from the level of a boss to the level of fiancé. She told them that Daniel is the person she is dating and they are planning to get married as soon as possible. Mary's father was very happy with what his daughter told him. He welcomed Daniel again. He asked him about work, his parents, and many other things. While Daniel was being queried by Mary's dad, Mary and her mom ran to the kitchen to prepare lunch. After 45 minutes, lunch was ready and they all ate together. After lunch, Mary and Daniel asked to take their leave. They were followed to the car park by Mary's parents. They kept advising them till they left. When they got home, Daniel called his father and informed him about his visit to Mary's parents' house. He told his father that he was accepted very well and they have given him the opportunity to marry their daughter. One week after, Daniel and Mary picked a date for their wedding. Their wedding was widely publicized by their friends and colleagues. Everybody was happy for them because of their diligence at work. The wedding day arrived and it was a scene to behold. 
Guests came from all spheres of life to witness the occasion. Almost every police officer in Miami was at their wedding. They got a lot of gifts from the police high command. The couples got a new car from their boss because they fulfilled certain conditions. The police force had a rule then that if police officers marry each other, they will get a brand new car as a gift. As soon as Daniel collected the car gift, he handed over his old car to one of his friend that does not have a car. After the wedding party, Daniel and Mary returned to their hotel room. The next day after the wedding, they traveled to Paris for their honeymoon. Two weeks after, they returned to Miami because their holiday was over. The next day, they resumed back at work. Before their resumption, the Miami police have been fighting some deadly armed robbers. The armed robbers had sophisticated weapons. Therefore, the police found it difficult to overpower them. The armed robbers killed a lot of policemen during their cause of operation. As soon as Daniel and Mary resumed at the office, they were drafted to the unit that was saddled with the responsibility of arresting the deadly armed robbers. Daniel and Mary swing to work immediately. They went to the streets of Miami and interrogated people asking them what they know about the deadly armed robbers. After three days of interrogation, they finally got a lead. They met a tipster who gave them the hideout of the deadly armed robbers. The tipster told them that the best time to invade the hideout was in the night when they are asleep. With the information they got from the tipster, Daniel and Mary returned to base and assembled a team of armed policemen for the operation. They left the base at exactly 11 a.m and they got to the hideout at midnight. As soon as they got to the hideout, they forcefully opened the gate and went into the apartment. In the process of opening the gate, the armed robbers were able to detect the police and they engaged them in a heavy shootout. The shootout lasted for more than an hour with casualties from each side. After the shootout, the policemen killed five of the robbers and arrested the rest. While the policemen were assembling in front of their car, they noticed that Mary was missing. They went back into the building to search for her. While they were searching for her, they heard a loud noise from one of the rooms in the apartment. The policemen rushed down to the room and found Mary in a pool of blood. She sustained an injury during the shootout. She was rushed to the bus and taken to the hospital. Daniel could not sleep that night. The next morning, he was the first person to arrive at the hospital. When he got there, he was allowed to see Mary but she could not talk to him. As days went by, Mary's health deteriorated to the extent that she was using oxygen to breathe. Her condition deteriorated to the extent that friends and family were barred from seeing her. Days went by and Mary's condition did not improve. Daniel couldn't concentrate at work. His boss noticed his lack of concentration too. One day he called Daniel into his office and handed him a letter. At first, Daniel thought he has been sacked. When he got home and opened the letter, he realized that he was given two weeks' break to deal with the situation at hand. The break gave Daniel more opportunity to be with Mary. He goes to the hospital very early in the morning and leaves very late in the night. Most times, it is the doctors that usually tell him to leave because they don't allow people to sleep with patients at the hospital. On Sunday morning while Daniel was getting ready to visit Mary at the hospital, he received a painful phone call. While he was putting on his dress, he heard his phone ringing. The number looked strange to him, so he didn't want to answer the phone at first. But when the call did not stop, he decided to answer to know why the person kept calling him. As soon as he answered the call, he heard the voice of Dr. Henry who was the special doctor that was assigned to treat his wife. Dr. Henry told Daniel that he regrets what he wants to tell him but there was nothing he could have done to save the situation. Dr. Henry said he is afraid to tell Daniel that Mary is dead. The cell phone fell from Daniel's hand and he began to cry profusely. He cried from morning till night. He locked himself up in his room and was crying. He refused to open the door for anybody that came to see him. Three days after Mary's death, a police delegation led by the police boss came to visit Daniel. They found his door locked but they noticed that he was inside. They could hear his cry from where they were standing. The boss called Daniel and told him to open the door, but Daniel refused. The police had no option but to force their way inside the house to prevent Daniel from doing something harmful. When they gained entrance into the house, they met Daniel in a sorrowful state. The house was scattered. The smell of alcohol took over the house. They noticed that Daniel has been drinking since the day he heard of his wife's death. They cleaned the house and arranged everything that Daniel scattered in the house. While they were leaving, 
they took Daniel with them. Daniel was lodged in a hotel close to the police base. He was given three months to recover from his wife's death. After three months, Daniel resumed at his duty post. His first day of resumption was emotional. When he entered the office, everyone could not hold back their tears. The tears on everyone's face brought back Mary's memory. Daniel tried to control himself but he did not know when tears started rolling down his cheeks. After some time, he picked himself up and returned to his duty post. As soon as he resumed, an officer was allocated to him to replace Mary. But this time, a male officer. The officer briefed him on all the cases they had at the moment. Daniel started his day-to-day -day activities, but he found it very hard to take Mary's thoughts off him. One year after, Daniel was in the office when he received an emergency call from a toll-free line. The lady said she witnessed a robbery, and she called to inform the police. Daniel and his team immediately swung into action and apprehended the robbers. They brought the robbers to their base before charging them to court. When Daniel returned to the office the next day, he went through the phone records in search of the number of the lady that called. After some minutes, he was able to get the number. He called the lady and appreciated her for a job well done. He encouraged her to continue giving security agencies relevant information that would lead to the arrest of the people who have decided to terrorize the state. Daniel told the lady that he will like to meet her to show his appreciation because the operation gave him a promotion at work. The lady was so happy to hear about Daniel's promotion. She said she didn't want to accept his invite in the first place. But the good news he told her is what changed her mind. She asked Daniel if he was calling her with his cell phone number and Daniel replied in the affirmative. She said she will call him back and tell him where and when to meet her. Daniel appreciated the lady for accepting his wife before ending the call. His boss was already at the door to decorate him with his new rank while he was on the phone. When he noticed that Daniel has ended the call, he went into Daniel's office with some other officers to officially decorate Daniel with his new rank. While Daniel was driving home, his phone started ringing. He didn't answer the call because the number looked strange and he didn't want to break the law. The call kept coming in, but Daniel did not answer the call. When Daniel got home, he called the number to know who was calling him. When he called the number, Precious answered the call. Daniel said he doesn't know anybody called Precious. She had to explain herself before Daniel recognized. When Daniel eventually knew that it was the lady that made the emergency call, he pleaded with her. He told her that he did not pick the call because the number looked strange and he was driving home at that time. Precious said she called to inform him of where and where they will meet. She said Daniel should come to the fun garden on Sunday by 1 p.m. if he wants to see her. Daniel obliged. He told Precious that he will be there on Sunday by 1 p.m. Precious said goodbye to Daniel on the phone. She told him to take very good care of himself before ending the call. As soon as Precious ended the call, Daniel went to his bed and slept off. On Sunday morning, Daniel woke up early as he usually does. His first point of call was his gym center. After spending one hour in the gym, he returned to his room to rest. After resting for 30 minutes, he went to the kitchen to prepare breakfast. After taking breakfast, he returned to the couch to take some rest because he still had time. He set his alarm to 11 a.m. so that he does not sleep off. At exactly 11 a.m., his alarm started ringing. The alarm was so loud that he had to wake up even though he was fast asleep. When he woke up, he went to the bathroom to take his bath. He took his bath, dressed up, and sat back on his couch waiting for 12.30 before he hits the road. At exactly 12.30, he made his way to the fun garden. He called Precious and told her he was already on his way. Precious told him that she has been there waiting for him. Upon hearing that, Daniel started speeding because he doesn't want Precious to get angry even though the time she gave him was not up. At exactly 12.50 a.m., Daniel arrived at the fun garden. He called Precious to come and pick him at the gate. Precious came to the gate to pick him. When they entered the fun garden, they looked for a nice place to sit. Precious started by congratulating Daniel on his promotion at work. After congratulating him, she said she was curious to know why he wanted to see her. Daniel started by telling Precious about Mary. He told her how he met Mary, how they got married and she died a few days after sustaining gunshot wounds in an operation. He told Precious that he has not been himself since the incident. Precious felt sorry for Daniel. She said she feels what he has been going through but she wants him to remain strong and resolute. Daniel told Precious that the reason he invited her was that he was looking for someone he can confide in. 
He said since Mary died, he doesn't have a female friend that he shares his problems with. He told Precious that he wants her to be his friend and if possible his lover. Precious looked at Daniel in the eyes. She didn't know what to say. She felt Daniel's pain. Precious took Daniel's car key and told Daniel to follow her to her house. Ten minutes after, they arrived at Precious's house. They went in and sat down on the couch. Precious knew Daniel was sex-starved, so she wanted to give him sex. As soon as they sat on the couch, her hand started going through Daniel's body. Before you know it, Daniel's clothes were already off. Precious took off her clothes too and walked Daniel to her bedroom. They continued to have sex until late in the evening before Daniel took his leave. After that day, Precious and Daniel became lovers. They did everything together. Daniel was able to find comfort after Mary's death. Hey, guys, please let me know if this is right or your thoughts on this. My name is Angel. I am 18 years old. I was born in Michigan. I started my early life in Michigan. I live with my parent in a decent apartment in Michigan. I attended Michigan High School where I completed my high school education. After I graduated from high school, I moved to Kentucky with my sister. My sister also lived with my parent until she graduated from high school. She moved to Kentucky when she got a job with the Kentucky Postal Services. When I graduated from high school, my sister thought it was wise to join her in Kentucky so that she could help me secure a job. Four months into my stay with my sister, I got a job at the Kentucky Mall. The Kentucky Mall was one of the biggest malls in the United States of America. A huge number of people come into the mall every day. I was enjoying the job because it allowed me to meet a lot of people. I receive a lot of gifts from strangers who just admire how I do my job. One day while I was at work, a young man in his mid-twenties approached me. He asked for my name. I told him my name is Angel. He wanted to continue the conversation but I declined because I was on duty. Our superiors watch what we do at our duty post through the CCTV camera. We were given a rule book before we were employed. The rule book contains the dos and don'ts of the organization. It is stated in the rules that staff that violate any rule will be sacked immediately. One of the rules is that staff are not allowed to hold conversations with customers aside from business conversations. When I noticed that Terry's conversation was about violating the rules and regulations of the organizations, I quickly stopped him and told him to leave. Terry insisted on having my cell phone number before he leaves, so I gave him. I warned him not to call my cell phone during working hours because I will not be able to answer his call. I told him to call me around 6 p.m. if he wants to talk to me. Terry collected my number and left. When Terry left, Mr. Patrick came to me and asked me why I was talking to Terry during business hours. I explained to him that what happened was not my fault. I told him I told Terry to leave when I noticed he was talking about something outside the business. I t old Mr. Patrick there was no way I would be able to know that he didn't mean to buy something the first time he approached. Mr. Patrick was satisfied with my explanation. He told me to be careful with male customers so that I do not fall in the wrong hands of the law of the organization. I thanked Mr. Patrick and he left. I continued attending to customers until 6 p.m. When I checked the time and it was 6 p.m., I called the attention of the manager. I told him my time was up. The manager told me to wait for the person that will replace me before I leave. He said he has contacted her and she told him she will be there in 10 minutes. He pleaded with me to wait for her. At exactly 6.10 p.m., Mariah arrived. She knew I wasn't happy because it was her lateness that kept me at the duty post longer than expected. I handed over the goods to her and I went into the accounting room to calculate my sale for the day. At about 6.45 p.m., I finished my calculation. As soon as I finished my calculation, I handed over the money to the manager and I went into the bathroom to change my clothes because I wasn't putting on our company's uniform. After changing into my homeware, I headed out to my house. I was about to board a bus when I heard my phone ringing. I didn't pick the call because I wanted to settle down in the taxi before picking any call. No sooner had I sat down in the taxi than my phone began to ring again. I brought out my phone from my bag to see who was calling me. When I looked at my phone, I noticed that the call was from Terry. I didn't want to pick the call in the first instance because I wouldn't be comfortable talking to him in a taxi. But when he did not stop calling, I eventually picked the call and I told him that I was in a taxi. He asked me why I left work late. I told him the person that was supposed to replace me if I leave did not come early enough so I had to wait for her. I told him to call me in the next 30 minutes because I would be at home by then. He told me he would do that and I dropped the call. At about 6.30, I arrived home. I was very tired and hungry. I went to my room and take a shower. After taking the shower, I went to the dining to eat lunch. After my lunch, I went back into my room to rest. I wanted to sleep well so that I would be ready for the activities of the next day. My job is very demanding. Most times, I usually stand on my feet from when I resume in the morning until when I close in the evening. 
No sooner had I lied on my bed than my cell phone started ringing. Without checking the screen of my cell phone, I knew it was Terry. I answered the call and it was Terry. He asked me how my day went and I told him that my day was stressful. I told him that I was about to sleep before his call came through. I told him that I wouldn't have picked his call if I was not the one that told him to call me back in the next 30 minutes. I told him that whenever I get home from work, I take my shower, eat and go to bed because I am always tired. Terry said he knew how demanding my work was because he had a cousin that worked in a mall a few years ago. He said his cousin complained of tiredness whenever he comes from work too. Terry said he would allow me to sleep but I should tell him when I will be off duty so that we can go out and spend some time together. I told him I will be off duty on Sunday. He asked me where he should take me to. I told him that we can meet anywhere he feels is okay. Terry insisted that I choose a place, so I settled for the Kentucky Museum. I told him it has been my dream to visit the museum since I was young. I said I felt this is the opportunity I have to visit the museum for the first time. Terry and I bid each other good night and I dropped the call. As soon as I dropped the call, I covered myself in my duvet and slept off. I woke up in the morning feeling very happy because I would be visiting the museum for the first time. The museum is one place I looked forward to visiting since I was young. None of the high school excursions I went on excited me like this one I was about to go for. While I was at work, I was hoping for Sunday to come. I did everything I had to do at work perfectly to avoid coming to work on Sunday. One of the rules of our organization was that any staff that fails to balance his account on Friday or say will have to come to work on Sunday to balance his or her account. The management does not condone the postponement of the account of the previous week into the new week. On Sunday after the close of work, I rushed down to the account room to do my account. I made sure all my accounts were perfect before I handed over my sale book to the manager. The manager cross-checked my sale book with the money I gave him. He saw that everything was perfect before he allowed me to leave. I got home very late because I stayed longer than expected at the office. I ate first because I was very hungry. After eating, I went into my room and took a shower. After taking shower, I lied down on my bed waiting for the next day. While I was surfing the internet on my phone, Terry's call came through. I answered the call. We talked about many things. He said he couldn't wait to meet me the next day. I said I also can't wait. He noticed that I was feeling sleepy, so he didn't take much of my time. He told me to go and sleep so that I will be healthy for the next day. I bided him goodbye and I dropped the call. Immediately I dropped the call, I covered myself in my duvet and I slept off. I woke up very early the next morning because I had some laundry to do. I packed all my laundry clothes into the bathroom and I began to watch them. I finished my laundry in about an hour. As soon as I finished my laundry, I took my bath immediately. After taking my bath, I slept on my bed waiting for my sister to call me for breakfast. Fifteen minutes later, I hear a knock on my door. I stood up to check who was at my door. When I opened my door, I met my sister standing in front of my door with tea and her bread in her hands. She said she decided to bring it to my room because she knew I was tired. I thanked my sister and collected the tea from her. I took my tea and returned to my bed. The only thing I was waiting for was Terry's call. I didn't want to call him myself in order not to sound desperate. While I waited for Terry's call, I took one of the novels I bought recently and started reading. Thirty minutes later, Terry called. He asked me how my night was and I told him it was fine. He asked me if I have taken breakfast and I told him I took tea and bread. He asked me what time do I want us to meet. I told him I am free throughout the day, so I am fine with any time he chooses. He said he would come and pick me with his car by 11 a.m. He said he doesn't want me to go through any stress. I was speechless as Terry was talking. I could see how caring he was. I told him I will be waiting for him in front of my house before he arrives. My sister was in the sitting room when I was talking to Terry. When I dropped the call, she came to my door and knocked. I was wondering why my sister was at my door again while I stood up to open the door. When I opened the door, I saw her standing at my door. She asked me who I was talking to. I told her the person I was talking to is my friend that I met at my workplace. I told her that he wants to take me to the museum today. She asked me why I didn't tell her about Terry before. I said Terry is just a friend and there is nothing between us. She told me to take care of myself when we go out. I told her that Terry will come and pick me in front of our house, therefore, she will have the opportunity to see him. After talking to my sister, I sat on the couch in anticipation of Terry's arrival. At exactly 11 a.m., I saw Terry's call. When I answered the call, Terry told me that he was in front of our gate. I rushed outside to meet him. When I got outside, Terry was sitting in his car. I told him to come down and say hi to my sister before we leave. I brought Terry into our sitting room and I called my sister. I left Terry and my sister and rushed down into my room to dress. After dressing, I came out and told Terry that we can leave. Terry and I walked to his car and we drove off. Three oh minutes later, we arrived at the Kentucky Museum. The museum was filled to the brim as different people from other states came to see how the museum looked like. 
Terry took me through all the galleries of the museum. At each gallery, a museum worker was stationed there to tell people about the story of the gallery. After going through the galleries in the museum, we went to the restaurant to get some food and drinks. While we were eating I noticed that Terry could not take his eyes off me. The looks on his eyes suggested that he had something in his mind. I sat patiently waiting for Terry to tell me what was in his mind because I was ready to accept him if he proposes to me. A few minutes into the discussion, Terry began to ask me relationship questions. Terry asked me if I am in a relationship. I told him I am not in any relationship. He asked me why. I told him I wasn't in any relationship because I haven't someone I love. He asked me if I have been in any relationship before. I told him I dated a guy while I was in high school. But it didn't last long. I told him that the guy and I went our separate ways when we graduated from high school. I didn't allow him to finish his question before I asked mine too. I asked him if he is in any relationship. Terry said he is not into any relationship. I asked him why he is not in any relationship and he said his answer correlates with the answer I gave him when he asked me the same question. Terry said he has been searching for the right person but he hasn't gotten one. He said since the day he saw me at the mall, he hasn't stopped thinking about me. He said everything about me just wowed him. He said he wants us to be dating. He said he will be happy if I accept his proposal. I remained speechless for a few seconds. I didn't know what to say. I love Terry but I didn't want to appear to him as a cheap girl. So I decided to stretch it a little bit. I told Terry that I am afraid of men. I said I don't want to fall in love with a man who will later stop caring for me. I told him how most men run after ladies because of sex. Once they get what they want, they abandon the lady. Terry interjected. He said he is not like that. He said he will take care of me. He said he will love me to the end of time. He said if he didn't love me, he wouldn't have come to me the day he saw me. He said I should try and understand him and give him a chance to be my boyfriend. I looked at Terry in the eyes and it appeared to me like he meant what he was saying. He looked like someone that loved me truly. I told Terry that I heard what he said but he has to give me time to think about it very well. He said he is not in a rush. He said I should take my time to make the best decision that is good for me. After the long discussion, we left the restaurant. There was a concert going on at the museum, so we went there to relax. The invited musician sang melodious songs that make everybody stand on their feet. I didn't know when Terry and I began to dance. We danced like couples throughout the show. The concert ended at 4.30 p.m. and I told Terry that it was time to go home. I told him that my sister will start calling me if she does not see me by 6 p.m. We went to where Terry's car was parked and we entered the car. At exactly 5 p.m., we arrived at my house. Terry came down from the car while I also came down. I was wondering why he came down. He walked close to me and he hugged me tightly. He whispered in my ear that he loves me. He said I should think about what he told me very well and make a decision that will make him happy. While I was about to enter my gate, he asked me that what time should he be expecting a positive reply from me. I told him that I need about a week to think about it. I said after a week, I will make my decision and I will let him know. I waved him goodbye while he entered his car. I waited for him to drive off before I entered my house. When I entered our house, I met my sister sitting on the couch. She welcomed me and asked me how my day went. I told her how Terry took care of me. I told her about all the places Terry took me to in the museum. I told her how he stood by me in all the places we went to. My sister said she knew he would be a good man when she saw him. I sat close to my sister on the couch and I began to wonder if I should tell her about Terry's proposal. The way she accepted him when I was describing how he took care of me to her gave me the confidence that my sister will not have any problem with me dating Terry. I finally summoned the courage to tell her about Terry's proposal. I went very close to her and I held her arm. I told her all Terry said. I told her how he said he is interested in having an affair with me. She allowed me to finish my speech before she asked me what I told Terry in reply. I told her that I didn't give him an instant reply. I told her that I told Terry that I needed a week to think about it. My sister was very happy with the reply I gave Terry. She said Terry appeared to her like a nice and honest guy. She said he looks to her like someone that can take very good of a woman. She said the ball is in my court. I should do what I think is the best. She said I should date Terry if I think dating him is the best or I should reject his proposal if I think rejecting his proposal is the best for me. She said she is good with any decision that I take. I hugged my sister and I appreciated her for always being there for me when I need her. I told her I couldn't have come this far without her. I told her I will continue to love her. I waved her goodbye and I entered my room. I was thinking of calling Terry to appreciate him for taking him out before his call came in. When I saw his call, I hurriedly answered the phone. As soon as I answered the call, I told him I was about to call him before his call came through. He said he just wanted to know if I am fine. I told him I am fine. He said he will allow me to rest so that I would be ready for work the next day. He told me to greet my sister and take care of myself. I told him to take care of himself too before I dropped the call. As soon as I dropped the call, I covered myself in my duvet and I slept off. The next morning, I didn't wake up as early as I should. It took the intervention of my sister to get me up from bed. She kept knocking until I woke up. 
When I opened my eyes, the time was 6.50 a.m. and I have to be at work by 8 a.m. I hurriedly took my bath and put on my uniform. I called a taxi while I was dressing, so the taxi arrived before I finished putting in my dress. I got to work at exactly 7.50 a.m. I went straight to the manager's office to fill the worker's attendance sheet before resuming at my duty post. While I sat down at my duty post, I couldn't take Terry's thoughts off my head. My mind was already attached to him but I was still having a second thought whether dating Terry was the best for me. At exactly 12 noon, we went for a lunch break. After I ate at the restaurant, I checked on my phone to see if I have a call that I needed to return before I returned to my duty post. When I opened my phone lock, I saw two missed calls and two text messages on my phone. I checked my phone and I noticed that it was Terry that called and he was the one that sent the text message. I immediately returned his call. I told him I didn't pick his call because I was at my duty post. I told him that the rules and regulations of our organization do not allow us to pick calls when we are on duty. I told him I can only talk to him during lunch break or when I am at home. Terry apologized and promised not to call me during work hours. He said he will only call me when he is sure that I am on lunch break. I told him that my time was up and I have to return to my duty post before I ran afoul of the law. I told him to take of himself. I told him I will call him when I get home. I closed from work at around 7 a.m. like I always do. I was about to board a taxi when I saw Terry's call. I didn't want to answer the call at first, but I later answered it. When I answered the call, I intended to tell Terry to call me back when he gets home, but Terry shocked me. He said I should meet him in front of my workplace. I asked him what he was doing in front of my workplace. He said he left his workplace very early, so he decided to take me home. I rushed down to meet him. I was very happy because I wouldn't go through the stress of waiting for a taxi. When I got there, Terry was in his car waiting. I opened the door and I entered. I asked him why he had to drive a long distance to pick me from work. Terry said he could do anything for me. He said picking me up from work is the least thing he could do to show me that he loves me. While Terry was driving home, we talked about many things. When we were about two minutes to my home, Terry told me that he will like me to visit him at his home on Sunday. He said he will be happy if I show up. He convinced me to the extent that I could not decline his invitation. Terry doped me at my house and he drove off. My sister noticed that I arrived home earlier than I used to. She asked me what happened. I told her that I didn't wait for a taxi today. I told her Terry surprised me by showing up at my workplace. I told her how Terry insisted that he was going to drive me home. I told her he didn't allow me to decline because he was already at my office before he called me. My sister couldn't believe it. She kept reminding me what she told me about Terry. She said she was convinced that Terry is a nice guy the first day she saw it. She asked me if I have yielded to his proposal. I told her I haven't but I will by the weekend because he has invited me to his house. You could see the joy on my sister's face. She was very happy for me. She was happy that I was getting into a serious relationship for the first time. The D-Day came and it was as if I have never seen a man before. I had already called Terry the previous that I would be coming to his house by 11 a.m. I was already up from my bed at around 7 a.m. I woke up that early because I had to do some laundry before I leave. I went to my sister's room to collect her laundry clothes because she was preparing breakfast. I wanted to take the stress off her. I finished the laundry at exactly 9 a.m. I was about to enter the bathroom to take my bath when my sister called me that breakfast is ready. I told her to eat hers while I take my bath. After taking my bath, I went to the kitchen to take my breakfast. My sister asked me what I wanted to do next. I told her I was going to my room to dress up for my outing. My sister said she will follow me to my room. She said she will choose the outfit that I will wear to Terry's house. I didn't have any option other than to allow her. She finally chose an outfit for me and I put it on. I had already called a taxi while I was eating. The taxi man arrived at the exact time I finished dressing. I waved my sister goodbye while I was about to enter the taxi. She waved back at me and she told me to take care of myself. I arrived at Terry's house at exactly 11.10 a.m. He was already waiting for me at his gate because I called him a few minutes before we got to his house. When I alighted from the taxi, Terry kept complimenting my beauty and my outfit. He said I look exactly like an angel that I was named. We both entered his sitting room and I sat on the couch. Terry asked what I wanted but I told him I ate before I left home. Terry was not happy with my response. Because I didn't want him to be sad, I told him to bring me a bottle of wine. Terry brought the wine to where I was sitting and sat close to me. He asked me if I have accepted his proposal. I told him that I have accepted his proposal because I was convinced that he is a nice guy. Upon hearing what I said, Terry hugged me tightly. I felt comfortable in his arms. When Terry noticed how comfortable I was in his arm, he kissed me and I kissed him too. We started kissing passionately on the couch. After kissing for some minutes, Terry carried me into his bedroom. We continued our kissing and romancing on Terry's bed. We romanced each other to the extent that none of us could hold it anymore. Terry and I undressed and we had sex. I experienced what I have never experienced in my lifetime and it was very interesting.
After the sex, I entered his bathroom and took a shower with Terry. While we were taking shower, we were still kissing. After taking the shower, I dressed up and Terry drove me home. Since that day, I have not been able to take Terry's thoughts off my head. Our love waxed stronger which was what prompted me to have a tattoo of Terry on my chest. When I told him that I wanted to have his tattoo on my chest, he was very happy. I told my sister about it too. She said if that is what I want, there is nothing she can do. She said I should just do what is best for me. The next Sunday that I was off duty, Terry took me to the tattoo center himself. He said he wants to be the first person to see how the tattoo. Five months after I tattooed Terry's name on my chest, Terry was involved in a ghastly car accident somewhere in Miami. Terry and his friends were traveling from Kentucky to Miami when they had that accident. Neither Terry nor his friends survived the car accident. Two of his friends died on the spot, while Terry died after the third day of the accident in a hospital. Since Terry died, I cannot stop thinking about him. Anytime I look at the tattoo on my chest, I just wish I could see or talk to Terry one more time. Death they say is inevitable, but it took away the person I loved most away from me. Hey, guys, please let me know if this is right or if this is what I should do or please let me have your thought on this. How I caught Mr. John and Miss Eva on my first day in school. When you meet some people, you begin to think they do not have feelings because of the way they act when they are around the opposite sex. People like that are always found in each organization, society, workplace, or home. I know you have started guessing what I am talking about, but you need to read my entire story to completely know what I am saying. This story is based on what happened in my high school. My name is Sophia. I am a teenager who just entered high school after completing my primary education. When I completed my primary education, I was spoilt of choices on the secondary school to attend because there were many schools close to my locality. After taking my time to inspect all the schools and their facilities, I finally settled for St. Peter's High School. My dad and my mum allowed me to choose the high school I wanted to attend. The same cannot be said of my friends. Most of them had to settle for the schools their parents chose for them. I chose Monday to inspect the schools. I visited all the schools in my locality on Monday, but I had to return to St. Peter's on Friday because it was the school that caught my attention the most during my inspection on Monday. My visit to St. Peter's on Friday cemented my choice. At that point, there was no going back. It was either St. Peters or nothing. I waited for my father to return from work on Friday so that I can inform him. My father usually returns from work every Friday because his office is far from our house. He leaves home very early on Monday and returns every Friday. When I heard the sound of my father's car on Friday, I ran outside to welcome him like I always do. We both hugged each other and I collected his bag and his shoes. I took his bag and his shoes inside while he was talking to one of our neighbors. I sat on the couch patiently waiting for when my father will enter the room. As soon as my father entered the room, he went straight to the bathroom to have a bath. After bathing, he came to the kitchen to have his dinner that was already served by my mom. You could see that my father was very hungry from the way he was eating his food. I wanted to engage him in a conversation when he was eating, but I knew I would not get his 100% concentration because of the hunger. I sat patiently on the couch waiting for my father to finish eating his food. After 15 minutes, I noticed that my dad was now satisfied. He was already engaging my mom in a conversation. He and my mom were talking about what happened at his office. He was telling my mom how the week was very stressful. After all, he had to attend to a lot of files because his boss did not show up at the office throughout the week due. My mom also told him that she had a stressful week at the office too. She said her company got submitted and defended a proposal. She said she and one of her colleagues were the ones saddled with the responsibility of defending the proposal. My dad asked her if they have been awarded the project. She said the company is still assessing the performance of all the companies that submitted a proposal. I lied on the couch when I noticed that their conversation was getting longer than expected. All I had in mind was that I will inform him about my choice of school before he goes to bed. After about two hours, my dad left the dining and joined me on the couch. I told him how I have been waiting for him for the past one hour. He asked me why I was waiting for him and I told him that I have something important to tell him. I noticed that my dad exhibited fear on his face because I am not the type that gets serious when talking to him. I always laugh when I want to talk to him. Therefore, the seriousness that I put on made him exhibit fear. On my own. I deliberately put up a serious face because I didn't want him to reject my choice. I wanted him to see some element of seriousness in me. I told him it was about my school. He asked me if I have finally chosen a high school I will attend when school resumes. I told him that I have found one. He asked me the name of the school and where the school is located. I told him the name of the school is St. 
Peter's High School. I do not need to tell him the location because he knows the school very well. He usually drives past the school when he is going to work. He asked me why I chose St. Peter's High School instead of other schools in our locality. I told him that I inspected all the schools in our locality one after the other. I said I chose St. Peter's High School because I felt St. Peter's High School is better than the others in terms of infrastructure and many other things. I told him I will be happy if he allows me to go to St. Peter's. My dad was silent for some seconds. I asked him why he was silent. He was just looking at me. After some minutes, my dad finally agreed. He said since St. Peter's High School is my choice, he is good with it. He said he just wants to be sure whether I have chosen the best. I explained to him why I think St. Peter's is the best. I told him how I visited the entire school one after the other before I finally made my decision. My dad said it is good. I got up from where I was seating and hugged him. My dad said he was going to personally drive me to the school the next Monday to make inquiries about the school. I couldn't contain my joy as I made my way to my room. When I entered my room, I lied down on my bed hoping that the next day will be Monday. I woke up the next morning with a big smile on my face. The smile was so huge that my parents noticed it. My dad asked me why I was so happy. I told him I can't wait to go with him to St. Peter's High School on Monday. I told him how the house has been boring since I started staying at home. A few minutes into the discussion with my dad, my mom called us to the dining. She has prepared tea and bread for us. My dad and I joined my mom in the dining and we continued our discussion. After the meal, we returned to the sitting room to watch a movie. My dad relaxes during the weekends by watching different movies. My dad and I watched movies for more than five hours before he stepped out to see his friend. I wanted to follow him because I know how boring the house will be. But my father declined. When my dad left, I returned to my room and continued with the novel I was reading. I read the novel till late in the night. I left my room when my mom called me that dinner has been served. My dad was also back from where he went to. I joined my parents at the dining and we all had dinner together. After the meal, I waved my parents goodnight as they made their way into their room. They waved me goodnight too and they told me not to forget my prayer before I sleep. As soon as I entered my room, I picked up my novel from where I left because I wanted to read it completely before the next day. The next day is Sunday and it's always a busy day for the family because we usually leave home very early for church and we will return very late in the night. I read my novel until around 3 a.m. before I decided to sleep, knowing fully well that the remaining chapters of the novel would not take me more than 20 minutes to complete. At exactly 7 a.m., I heard a knock on my door. I knew it was my parents. They want to wake me up so that I can get ready for church because we usually leave home by 7.30 a.m. I didn't want to leave my bed because I was still feeling sleepy. The sleep I had at the time they came knocking was not more than four hours. My parents continued knocking repeatedly when they noticed that I did not leave my bed. When the knocks became unbearable, I had no option but to leave my bed. I stood up from my bed and made my way to the door. When I opened my door, I met my parents standing in front of my door waiting for me to come out. My father asked me why it took so long for me to open the door. I told him I was fast asleep because I slept very late. My father asked me why I slept very late when I knew there was church service the next day. I closed the door and rushed to the bathroom because my parents were already waiting. After taking my bath, I picked up one of my clothes and I rushed outside to meet my parents who were already waiting for me. We prayed in the sitting room and we all made our way to the car. We entered the car and my dad drove off. While driving, my dad told me how important it was for me to sleep early. He said as a teenager, I need eight hours or more of sleeping time. He said he was not happy with me because I almost made him and my mum late for church. My parents like going to church very early because they are part of the church executives. Church executives are expected to be at the church 30 minutes before the church program starts. I told my father that I was sorry. I told him that I will not repeat such. My father said he has accepted my apology, but he wants to tell me some of the dangers of lack of having proper night rest. I told him that I was listening. My father said there are short-term and long-term dangers of lack of proper sleep. He said the short dangers are a lack of alertness. He said missing two hours from the recommended eight hours can have an impact on the feeling of an individual. He said another short-term danger is excessive sleeping during the daytime. He said if care is not taken, I won't be able to participate in any church activity today. I told him I will make sure I participate in all church programs. I said my lack of sleep will not hinder my performance in church. My father continued with his lecture. He said another short-term danger of lack of proper night rest is that it can lead to road accidents if the individual is the one driving. My father said even if he had taught me how to drive before today, he wouldn't have allowed me to drive the car as soon as he noticed that I did not sleep very well the previous night. My father said all the dangers he listed are short-term dangers. He said others that are more dangerous than the ones he has mentioned. He said we will continue with that when we are heading back home. As soon as we drove into the church, 
My dad and my mom rushed out of the vehicle to join the church executives meeting which had already started. I went into the church to wait for when church service will commence because church service usually commences after the executive meeting. After about 15 minutes, the executives meeting ended and all the executives made their way into an already filled church. The service started with an opening prayer by the presiding bishop. After that, other church activities followed. I noticed that my father was looking at me when the church service was going on. He wanted to be sure that I was not sleeping, although I was feeling sleepy. I composed myself because I didn't want my dad to catch me sleeping. I know if he does, I will be the topic of discussion in the house. I was the topic of discussion in the car but I didn't want my case to extend to the house. I did all my best to participate actively in all the church activities. After about six hours, the church program ended, and it was time to go home. When my dad told me that it was time to go home, two things came to my mind. The first was that I was happy because I will have the opportunity to sleep when I get home. The second thought was how will I be able to endure the series of the lecture that will come up in the car. My father didn't complete his lecture when we were driving to church in the morning and he promised to continue on our way home. I know my dad never forgets, so I couldn't pray for him to forget. I entered the car thinking how I was going to endure another series of lectures. As soon as I entered, we drove off. My father was silent for a few minutes. At first, I thought he has forgotten what he promised to talk about. No sooner than my mom tell my dad that she was tired than he began his lecture again. He called me by my name Mariah. He said we were talking about something when we were driving to church in the morning. I told him that we were talking about the dangers associated with a lack of having proper night rest. I reminded him that he has told me about the short-term dangers. I said it's the long-term dangers that he promised to talk about when we are heading back home. My dad was impressed thinking I enjoyed the morning lecture. He didn't know how boring it sounded to me. He didn't know that I had to listen because there was nothing I could do. He didn't know that if I had an option. I wouldn't step out of the house in the morning not to talk of listening to a very long lecture. The reminder gave him the impression that I enjoyed the lecture, and you could see from his face that he was willing to continue. He started the second phase of the lecture by asking me if I understood everything he said in the morning while we were driving to church. I told him that I understood everything perfectly. Then, he began with the long-term dangers. He said one of the long-term dangers of lacking proper night rest is high blood pressure. He said others are diabetes, heart attack, heart failure or stroke, obesity, depression, impairment in immunity, low sex drive, premature wrinkling in dark circles under the eyes, increase in the stress hormone, and cortisol in the body. He said there are many other dangers, but these are the ones he can tell me for now. He said all these diseases are very difficult to cure. He said if a patient contract all the diseases he mentioned, it is very difficult to treat them completely. He said in most cases, the patient will have to be living with the disease until he or she dies. He asked me if I will want to contact any of these diseases at a young age. I told him that I do not want to. He said if I do not want to contract any of those diseases, I have to be sleeping at least eight hours every day. He said if I am watching a movie or reading a book, I should drop whatever I am doing when it is time for bed. He said the movie I am watching or the book I am reading won't go anywhere. He said I can continue with my movie or my book when I wake up the next day. At first, I wasn't interested in the lecture, but when I started realizing that what my dad was telling is right, I started paying attention. I appreciated him and I told him I will heed all his advice. My dad said he will end his lecture with some tips on how to sleep better. He said if I want to sleep better, I should follow some of this advice. He said I should treat getting enough sleep as if it is important. He said, for now. I have the opportunity of choosing when to sleep because I do not have a job that can stop me. He said I should schedule an adequate time for sleep. He said another tip is to keep a consistent wake time. He said I should wake up at the same time every day. He said waking up at the same time every day will help you sleep better at night. He said a fixed wake time helps to build a strong desire throughout wakefulness. He said keeping a consistent wake time gradually builds and shortening it by sleeping will make it harder to fall asleep the next night. He said another very important tip is to put my phones and my novels away as soon as it's time for sleep. He said books and phones keep the mind humming and far from the relaxed state that the body needs before bedtime. He said I should keep my books and my phone far away an hour before my bedtime. I appreciated my dad for the lecture as we made our way into our compound. We all came down from the car and we entered the house. We were all hungry. So my mom rushed into the kitchen while my dad and I sat on the couch. My dad put on the television set because he wanted to watch a football match between Manchester United and Arsenal. My father doesn't miss Arsenal matches because he is a very big fan. He is always in a joyous mood anytime Arsenal wins a match. One of the best times to collect money from my dad is when Arsenal wins a match. There was still 30 minutes before the start of the match so my dad left the television set and picked up the iron 
and went to the laundry room to prepare the clothes he will use at work for the week. My dad likes to do his things by himself, so my mom does not bother herself with his office wear. Five minutes to the commencement of the match, my father left the cloth he was ironing and rushed down to the sitting room. My mom called me to join her in the dining, but he declined. He told my mom to bring his food for him in the sitting room. My dad does not like any disturbance when it's time to watch Arsenal Football Club. My mom had no option but to bring his food to the sitting room. As soon as she served him his food, she went back to her room because she doesn't like football. A few minutes into the match, you could see how uncomfortable my dad was because Manchester United was playing better than Arsenal. He kept shouting at the players even though they could not hear him. Twenty minutes into the match, Manchester United scored through Fred. The goal changed my dad's mood. I looked at him and I saw how sad he was. The food my mom served him was still in his front. He hadn't eaten more than three or four spoons. Forty-five minutes after, the referee blew the whistle for halftime. I told my dad to eat his food before the commencement of the second half because I know if Arsenal loses after ninety minutes, my dad might not eat his food. He picked up his food and started eating. I went to the fridge to help him get a chilled drink. He ate the food and he took the drink. He slept on the couch waiting for the second half to commence. As soon as the players started making their way into the pitch, my dad stooped up from his sleeping position and sat down. The referee blew the whistle for the commencement of the second half. No sooner than the second half began than my father began to shout at the players. I kept telling him that the people he was shouting at cannot hear what he was saying. Sixty-five minutes into the match, Arsenal equalized through Ben White. My dad jumped for joy as Ben White headed the ball into the net. The match continued and there was no goal until 80 minutes. 88 minutes into the match, Arsenal took the lead through Gabriel. My dad couldn't contain his joy. He was laughing uncontrollably. He told me to get him a bottle of wine from the fridge for celebration. After the three minutes of added time, the referee blew his whistle for full time. My dad jumped up that I had to warn him to check the ceiling fan. He opened the wine I brought for him and started drinking. He celebrated the victory until about 9 p.m. when he wanted to go to bed. As soon as I noticed that he was going to bed, I called him and reminded him that the next day is Monday. I told him that he promised to take me to St. Peter's High School to inquire about the school. My dad said he did not forget. He said there was nothing that would make him forget something like that. We waved at each other, and he entered his room while I entered mine. I was already feeling sleepy before I entered, so I lied down on my bed and covered myself with my duvet. In no time, I slept off. At exactly 5.30 a.m., my mom came to my door and knocked. As soon as I heard a knock on my door, I stood up and went to my door. When I opened my door, I saw my mom standing in front of my door. I greeted her and she responded. She said she came to wake me up so that I can get prepare myself before my father wakes up. I told her that I was already awake before she came. She left my door and I closed the door. As soon as I closed the door, I took up my shirt and went into my bathroom to take my bath. When I finished taking my bath, I put on the cloth that I had already prepared to wear for the day. After that, I sprayed perfume on my body, and I sat on my bed waiting for my father to come calling. At exactly 6.50 a.m., I heard a knock on my door. I hurriedly stood to open the door. When I opened the door, I saw my father standing at the door already dressed. He told me it was time to leave. He left my door and went straight to his car. He said I should join him. I locked my door and I went to my mom's room to tell her that I was leaving. She followed me to the car and told me to take care of myself. I entered the car and we drove off. At exactly 7.15, we arrived at St. Peter's High School. My father parked his car and we both alighted from his car. When we came down, my dad asked for the head teacher's office. We were directed to the head teacher's office but she was not on seat. We looked for a seat close to her office and sat down in anticipation of the head teacher's arrival. At exactly 7.45 a.m., the head teacher arrived. When she arrived, she was informed that she had people waiting for her. So she made her way to where we were seated. She greeted us and apologized for coming late. She opened her office and she told us to come inside. When we entered her office, she told us to sit. She gave us water to drink. After we drank the water, she asked us how she could help us. My dad told her that he wants me to join their school when the new session resumes. He told her that his visit to the school is to make an inquiry about the payment and to personally inspect the school himself to see if the facilities they have are up to the required standard. The head teacher said she is happy to have us. She said new students are to pay $1,000 for enrollment. She said the $1,000 will cover the school fee, registration fee, and every other thing I will need for the term. My dad said it was okay. The head teacher told us to follow her so that my dad can inspect the facilities in the school. She took us to the school pitch, the health center, the school hostels, the school library, 
and all the classes in the school. She introduced all the staff in the school to us. I was very happy as the head teacher was showing my dad the school infrastructure. At the end of the tour, you could see from my dad's face that he was very impressed with what he saw. We returned to the head teacher's office after the tour. My dad made the payment and he left. He drove to his office while I looked for a taxi to take me home. When I got home, my mom had already prepared lunch. I rushed down to the kitchen because I was very hungry. After eating, I explained what went down to my mom. I told her how I was already anticipating resumption. The day of resumption came and I was very happy. I woke up very early because I wanted to join my dad in his car. I took my bath and I wore my cloth. I sat on the bed waiting for my dad to call me. After some minutes, I heard a knock on my door. I stood up and rushed to the door because I knew it was my dad. When I opened the door, I met my dad standing in front of my door. He told me it was time to leave for school. I went to the kitchen to pick the food that my mom prepared for me. I put the food in my bag and I joined my dad in his car. As soon as I entered the car, my dad drove off. We arrived at St. Peter's High School at exactly 8 a.m. I alighted from my dad's car and we waved each other goodbye. When I entered, students were already in their class. I approached the security man for direction. He held my hand and took me to my class. A teacher was already in the class. As soon as I entered, he told me to introduce myself in front of the class. I told the class that my name is Mariah. I told them that I am 13 years. I told them about my family and what prompted me to St. Peter's High School. After introducing myself, the teacher told me his name. He said his name is Mr. John. He told me that he is my class teacher. He said I should come to him if I need any help in my academics. After introducing himself to me, he told me to take my seat. There was no available seat at the front so I had to make my way to the back seat. Mr. John is our mathematics teacher. He told us that his first lesson is just an introduction to the subject, so he won't stay long in our class. After talking to us for 20 minutes, he left our class and went to his office. I trailed him because I wanted to talk to him. I met him in front of his office talking to a female teacher. I got to know that the name of the teacher is Miss Eva because of her tag. I told Mr. John that I wanted to see him, but he said I should come back in five minutes. After five minutes, I went back to Mr. John's office. When I got to his office door, I noticed that it was locked. I was about to return to my class when I started hearing a noise in Mr. John's office. I went back to the back of his office where the window is located. I looked through the window and I saw Mr. John and Miss Eva kissing passionately. They were so engulfed in the kissing that they didn't know that someone was looking at them. After kissing for some minutes, Mr. John and Miss Eva both undressed and started romancing passionately. At that point, the noise that was coming out of Mr. John's office became very loud. They kissed and romanced until noon. I noticed that they started undressing when they heard the bell for break time. At that point, they knew all the students will rush out of their classes. They knew they will be caught if they do not stop immediately. Hey, guys please let me know if this is right or if this is what I should do or please let me have your thoughts on this. Let me have your thoughts on this. Let me have your thoughts on this. How I celebrated 2020 and what I'm willing to do in 2021. Hi guys, I am Tess. I am the last of a family of five children. The girls were three, and the boys were two. I was the third girl and the last child, and I must confess it had its advantages. I had the protection and favor of my elder siblings while growing up. If I was denied anything thing by either of them, I just had to go the next, and even I was still denied, I knew that I would get it before going to the five of them. On one rare occasion, it seemed as though they all ganged up on me as I was surprised when they all turned me down. Well, I always had a backup plan, mummy or daddy. It was really incredible being the major object to favor. During my childhood days, I was not given much chores as the others. I had the luxury of sitting in front of the television with a bowl of popcorn while others cleaned the house, and if I was asked to assist during my time out, I simply cried my eyes out until either mummy or daddy intervened by asking that I be left alone. I was not being spoilt. I was simply enjoying what every child who has siblings older than her should enjoy. It was as I advanced to my teenage years that I discovered that everything with an advantage equally has a disadvantage. I was sent on errands around the house at odd times by everyone. I was called to bring this, take this, pick this, get this, wash this, and every other annoying message which seemed to be available each time I wanted to have some fun. My strategy of crying and making noises just to alert mummy and daddy that it was time to come to my rescue seemed to now work very well against me as they only ended up getting mad at me for my disobeying my elders who did things for me when I couldn't do them myself. They made me understand that I was now grown up and needed to assume a level of responsibility around the house just as everyone else did. It was during those times I greatly wished that I was still the baby test that everyone wanted to pamper. The one-time center of attention for a favor now turned to the object used in getting little things done. 
Nevertheless, I would never trade my siblings for another. It was nice to have people that are ahead of me because it gave me an opportunity to learn from their mistakes and experiences. They always seemed to have opinions on every experience I was going through, and most times they would tell me how certain things were likely going to play out. My both parents were huge, and so we all looked bigger than our ages. At 20 years of age, my eldest sister, Nellie, could easily be mistaken for daddy's wife. She even behaved like a mummy, assistant mummy. She always looked out for the welfare of the rest of us. She wanted everything done in order, just as mummy would. She was neat, and would always frown at anyone who dropped a waist anywhere, or anyone who moved past something that was out of place. She was articulate and precise. In the absence of mom, she assumed the responsibility of dishing out chores and making sure that each one of us does thorough work. She always tried as much as possible to avoid mistakes, and she got so hard on herself when she did. Nellie was good at studying people, and often used her head rather than her heart. She was not always moved by emotions and sentiments. She was the toughest of us all, and she always demanded respect from the rest of us. This was where she often had issues with Richard. Richard was the second child and first boy. He was two years younger than Nellie, but you would think he was married. At 22, Richard looked so mature that if you visited our house when Dad was away, you would think that he was the man of the house, even though he never acted so. He loved his space and hated being bossed around, something Nellie often did. This was no wonder they always had issues that we had all gotten used to. Richard was a fine young man who was heavily built. He had no issues getting the attention of ladies. On several occasions, Richard had been approached by women who were far older than him. There was one time he was even approached by a married lady who was twice his age, and all she just wanted was sex. He, however, how best not to set a bad example for the younger ones who were behind him, so he often had his escapades with ladies outside the home. Patty was next in line. She was two years younger than Richard. She easily got along with people and had a great distaste for arguments. If you ever got into an argument with Patty over something that was rightfully hers, she was likely going to let it go. She always loved a serene and peaceful atmosphere. Patty was emotional and naive, and one could easily take advantage of her. It was no new thing to see Patty crying over a guy. She never did seem to learn her lesson though, as the next guy who shows her a little bit of affection was sure to win her heart. Two years after Patty was born, my parents welcomed Tim into the family. Tim was a good friend to keep, but a very bad for to have. He could love as easily as he could hate. Tim always saw the good in everybody, until he was shown their bad side. He was the kind of person who wouldn't judge another based on rumors. Tim had no issues trusting you. But when you betrayed his trust, one thing was certain. You had found a foe for life. It took about three years before I was introduced into the family tree, and that was because my parents never really planned for me. I came in a how. Though I wasn't planned for, I was welcomed. My parents, however, took measures to ensure I had no one behind me. We were a typical family, just like everyone else. We had the regular fights and misunderstandings which children in other homes had. However, one thing which was clear to outsiders was that they were not permitted to mess with either of us. An assault on one of us was an assault on all of us, and you could be sure that we would always react as a group. One time when Patty was seven years old, she was constantly picked on by a bully in her class. He constantly took a part of her lunch. Patty was not suited for a fight so she constantly let him have his way. This bully threatened to severely deal with her if she reported to anyone. She suffered quietly, not because she was afraid of what would become of her when she told her elder siblings, but she knew what awaited the bully once Nellie and Richard who were 9 and 11 years then, get to know. Her fear soon came to pass when the news of her maltreatment got to Nellie through a friend of Patty's. Nellie wasn't going to wait around to confirm it the rumor was true. She immediately marched down to the playground and saw crying as the bully was about to leave with part of her lunch. Like a hungry lioness who just found a defenseless lamb, Nellie pounced on him with all of her aggression and might. The bully couldn't tell what had hit him, but it hit him really hard. Patty and the few kids around stood watching. Nellie couldn't be stopped, and most of the kids didn't even want her to, because they have been victims of this notorious bully. Some kids ran to call any teacher in sight, while others ran to call Richard to come and stop Nellie. Richard was in class when he was told that Nellie was fighting at the playground. Richard quickly rushed to the playground, and rather than stop Nellie who was beating up the bully, he immediately joined her to inflict more pain. The teachers finally arrived and separated the fight. That day, our parents were called alongside the parents of the bully who had just lost three teeth. Upon inquiry, the school authorities discovered that Patty was not the only victim of this bully who had constantly picked on kids. He was suspended from school for four weeks while Nellie and Richard were sent on detention for taking laws into their hands. When the bully returned, he avoided Patty like S-plague. Even though we watched out for each other, 
and we often spent time together. There were still moments where the girls had secrets that they were not willing to share with the boys, and of course, there were things too that the boys didn't share with everyone else, so you could find the boys alone, separated from the girls. I, however, had the privilege of listening to both parties when I was allowed. I was the baby of the house after all. We all knew that Patty was vulnerable because of her personality, and could easily be taken for granted. So Nellie decided to help her whenever she passed through any crisis. She acted as a guide especially when it came to relationship issues with boys. What Nellie did for Patty, Richard did for Tim. Although Tim was more outspoken than Patty, it seemed as though he could sometimes be as naive, especially when it had to do with ladies, and so Richard who was ahead of him in every way equally acted as a guide. It didn't matter what advice and guidance these two had, they always seemed to fall prey. There was a guy who moved into the area where we stayed. He was 23 years old. He was cute, and the kind of guy every girl would die to have, and Patty was one of the girls. Ladies began flocking around him. Patty felt like the luckiest girl in the world when he started making advances at her. What others were running after, came running after her. She felt special, and that feeling was what got her into a mess. He was all Patty could, and would choose to think about. She went out of her way to please him as much as she could. Nellie knew this guy was no good. She had been there before, and she saw the red flag. She tried telling Patty to take things slow because not much was known about this guy. I watched as Patty defended him. She said his name was Matt, and he wasn't just any guy. Nellie knew that at this point, nothing she said to Patty would be welcomed by her, so she left her. It wasn't long before the things Nellie said started coming to light. Matt always had one sorry story, or the other to tell, so that he could feed off Patty's allowance. Whenever he took her out on a date, he always seemed to have misplaced his wallet which he claimed contained his credit card. Patty would end up paying. This was just his move, so he could have a free lunch, or dinner because he was totally broke, and did not know where his next meal was going to come from. He always claimed to have rich parents who were out of town, and he never failed to make empty promises to Patty which he never fulfilled. He promised to buy her the world when she would be celebrating her 18th birthday. However, three days before her birthday, he stopped talking to her. She tried getting in touch with him, but it was not possible. On her 18th birthday celebration, he was nowhere to be seen. Patty was furious, disappointed, and heartbroken. How could he disappoint her on the very day that she needed to show him to everyone? She just hoped that he had a good explanation. She couldn't imagine her elder sister Nellie being right all along. It was the day after her birthday celebration that he sent a message to her through one of his friends. He claimed to have been in the hospital for three days, and only just got back home. Patty felt bad, guilty, and sad. She became angry at herself for thinking that Matt may have played her when he was in the hospital all along. She quickly over his place. She was determined to stand by his side. Before leaving his place, she gave him part of the money she had received the previous day during her birthday celebration. It was when she had almost boarded a cab that she discovered she had left her mobile phone behind at Matt's place. It was when she was about knocking on the door that she overheard his discussions with his friends. He was not ill. He never was. It was his plan all along. He had no money to buy her the things that he had promised her for a birthday, and so he had to devise a means to stay away. He equally did not want to take the risk of being seen by some of Patty's friends who were equally his victims. He equally knew that Patty would get some monetary gifts at her birthday, and he wanted to have a share, and now he had. He had killed three birds with one stone. Patty listened with teary eyes as Matt and his friends made jest of her. They called her stupid, naive, crazy, and delusional for falling for Matt. They said that they were amazed to see someone this big with no brains to match her size, and it was only a matter of time before Matt would sleep with her. Patty was hit hard, and her wound was too deep. She had heard enough. She would probably die right there if she heard any more. She quickly turned around and found picked up a cab. The cab driver really felt sorry for Patty as he drove her back home. She was weeping as though she wanted to die from it. The driver who was seriously concerned about what might have happened to her failed at getting an answer from her. Immediately he got to our house, she ran out of the car and made her way into the house without paying him. We were all in the sitting room, dad, mom, and the rest of us when she ran past everyone without even waiting around to greet them. It was clear that something was wrong. But before we could get to her, she locked the door and began crying profusely. It was just then, that the cab driver came knocking on the door and politely told us Patty was yet to pay him. He did get his money, but it was after he was made to answer a series of questions about what happened to Patty. He told us all he knew, and from all indications, he was telling the truth. Nellie knew that whatever it was that put Patty this way had to do with Matt. We tried getting Patty to open up. It had been a whole day since the incident. She had missed dinner, and breakfast was about missing lunch. 
we all took turns to appeal to her to come out. She seemed not to listen to anybody, not even mom, and dad could get her to open up. It was Nellie who eventually had her open up after she told her that she knew Matt was behind this whole thing. When Patty came out, she looked really pale. And so before asking her any questions, we all pleaded with her to eat some food. After eating, Nellie helped clean her up before mom, and dad put her to bed. She needed rest. A lot of it. Richard and Tim eagerly waited just to know who, or what had caused their sister such pain. They just needed a name and address. It was an hour before dinner time that Patty woke up, and was finally ready to tell us what happened. Patty had barely gone halfway with her story when Richard and Tim made for the door, and we all knew their destination and next action. It took a lot for Daddy to restrain them both. Our dad was a cop, and so, he always wanted things done by the book. He had always been against us taking laws into our hands. After listening to Patty, Daddy noted that this was a fraudulent case of manipulation, one that the law seriously frowned at. Our dad did however note that, although Patty had just been victimized, there was no evidence to support her claim, and it was just her word against Matt. If we were going to get justice for Patty, then we needed to beat Matt at his own game. We needed some evidence. Patty was then made to call Matt that evening to tell him that she had left her phone at his place. Patty played her part so well that Matt didn't suspect a thing in the world. She asked about his health, about his friends, then asked to take him out for lunch the next day, so that he could bring her mobile phone along. It was the kind of opportunity Matt always desired, and so he readily accepted. The plan was to avoid going to his house now he was seen for what he was, a snake. Dad had to warn Patty against being in a private area with him because he could rape her. While she played her part, Dad would do some investigations just to know more about Matt. We all knew that Patty was going through a lot, and so we were very determined to give her all the love and support that she would need. She officially became the baby of the house on a temporal basis. Nellie knew that Patty had to set her emotions aside if she was going to successfully make Matt pay. She knew that Patty, who was very emotional, would find it very difficult playing Matt's own game of deception when she was still into him. So to help Patty, she called her that into her room that evening for a chit-chat. I was already with Nellie when she entered the room. She immediately began apologizing to Nellie for not taking her advice when she gave it. Nellie couldn't hide a grin as she told Patty that she was never angry at her. I listened as she told Patty that she only knew it would turn out this way because she had been there before. Just like Patty, she had been hurt severally in the past that she had now become familiar with the red flags and could tell someone who was a scam from a mile away. Nellie said that the knowledge she had gained from her bitter experiences made her decide to always put her head before her heart. She had toughened up over time. She now began advising Patty and me against tolerating what we don't like from a guy. She said that when you get a little bit tolerant, they end up trying to take you for a ride. And so, if at any point in any relationship, we become uncomfortable, we should immediately call it quits. There should always be a line which we shouldn't let the guys cross. She then further gave an instance of her experience with a guy three years ago. She said that when the guy wanted to date her, she never liked him because he was dirty. He had a terrible body odor that his cologne couldn't hide. When he opened his mouth to profess his undying love, she could only smell death. His breath stank. She saw that they were not compatible in any way. She took cleanliness very seriously, and he just seemed too comfortable in filth. It was a red flag which meant that she shouldn't go further. But because almost all of her friends were having boyfriends, she didn't want to feel left out. And so, she just tolerated him. It was when she was invited for a romantic dinner at his place that she knew the relationship was doomed. There was nothing romantic about the atmosphere. He was dirty to the bones and never seemed to care. This was more than she bargained for, and she wasn't having any more of it. It was when she told him that she couldn't continue anymore that he decided to rape her, and although he did not succeed because she raised an alarm, the incident traumatized her for a while. Nellie was a great sister, and she deserved every respect we gave her. Her words of encouragement were all Patty needed to hear. I usually enjoyed the times when we bonded like this. I never told anyone that I already had a guy who wanted me to be his girlfriend, thanks to Nellie. I then knew that it wouldn't work because of the red flags I saw. Her advice then made me realize what my vision for the coming year 2021 was, growing in self-love and personal development and I was determined to start actualizing the vision from the year 2020 that was soon going to be over. During lunch with Matt the next day, Patty was really composed. The words of Nellie last night had a great impact on her. She had rehearsed everything she was going to say, and how she was going to behave during lunch. As usual, she paid for the food with the money Dad had given her. Since the whole family was now involved, Dad and Mom made sure that she had the money needed to satisfy Matt's greed. Matt pounced on the dish without mercy. It was when he had eaten to his satisfaction that he then began reassuring Patty of his undying love. 
he claimed that he had been telling his imaginary rich parents about her, and they were eager to meet her when they got into town. Patty acted as she fell for his story, and even though Matt tried taking her back to his place, she claimed that she had to pick up groceries for Mum and that she had already overstayed. Before leaving, she gave him some money before he started making up stories. Later on during dinner, Daddy told us that he had been checking up the public records available, but nothing came out of it. There was no record of any Matt Delaney in the system. Something was not right. Why was there no information on him? It was at that point that my dad knew the case was more serious than we had taken it to be. He involved the state by officially opening a false identity and fraud case against the alleged Matt Delaney, and investigations officially began. Even though we were terrified at the suggestion that Patty took the risk of placing her life in the hands of a person she didn't know, we were relieved to learn that we now had the resources of the government about disposal. We, however, knew that we needed to play safe. We needed to be careful about the way we were using Patty as a tool in the investigation. It took three weeks before the breakthrough came. There had been three unsolved murder cases in various parts of the states. The victims who were usually raped before being killed were between 18 and 24 years of age. The pattern was always the same, but no matter how hard the authorities tried, it always led to a dead end. Finally, a shred of evidence had surfaced, and it led the investigators right into our city. After forensic scientists carried out several tests, the result matched the DNA which was obtained from the private part of one of the victims. It was while going through the file that my dad discovered a familiar face. It was Matt. However, although the face was the same, the name was not. The name was Todd Humphrey. There were equally two other faces alongside Todd. Patty was called in to see if she could identify any of the faces. When she got to the station, just as my dad had said, she identified Todd Humphrey as Matt, and she even went further to identify the remaining two faces as his friends who occasionally visited Todd. The cops immediately made a warrant for their arrest, but they were going to be strategic about it. The plan was to arrest the three friends at the same time, but it was difficult getting them to be in the same place. Two of the friends of Todd were arrested while on their way back from getting supplies, and several illegal items such as guns, ammunition, cocaine, and various fake passports containing their names. Upon interrogation, they both agreed to be involved in the killing of the three murder victims. They claimed that they would study the victims for weeks before either of them would try to establish a romantic relationship with the victim. They equally gave accounts of how they would dupe the victims of large sums of money and would eventually introduce the victim to drugs, but if the victim refused to be initiated into the use of drugs, they then knew that they stood a chance of getting reported to the authorities, and so, had no other option than to end the life of the victim. This, they did by taking turns to rape her before killing her. They noted that all three of their victims had refused to take drugs. The police raided Todd's house, but he wasn't there, just as his friends had said. They said that they have certain times which they communicated, and if there was no communication from anybody, then it was an indicator that something had gone wrong. It was when they were about communicating with Todd that the cops showed up, and Todd would probably have gone into hiding. The cops further questioned them to know if they had any idea where Todd might be hiding, but they said that they had decided against letting each other know their whereabout, just in case the police caught up with any of them. It was at this point that the police knew that Patty was their biggest chance of catching Todd, but they knew that if they alerted the neighborhood, he would be certain that he was wanted, and would further try to evade them. So they waited to see if he would contact her, and he did. Todd called Patty and claimed to be in danger. He said that some persons were after his life. They wanted to kidnap and make some money off of him because of who his parents were. He asked Patty for some money to get out of the city but promised to send it back to her when he got together with his parents. Patty said that she could have the money ready by 2 p.m. the following, but she didn't know how to reach him. He said that he couldn't disclose it to her for her own safety. However, he told her to get ready by 2 p.m as he was going to call her to give her directions on where to meet. As soon as he hung up the call, the cops who had been listening began setting plans in motion. The money was made available to Patty who equally had a tracker placed on her. The cops would have stationed themselves around the area where she would be meeting up with him if he had disclosed the location, but he was smart enough not to. He called Patty two hours before the agreed time. This action almost jeopardized the plan of the cops who were not yet ready as they thought that they still had two more hours. Patty was left with no other option than to go without the cops, as any delay would get Todd suspicious. Although all hope was not lost as she had the tracker on, the cops were far behind. Patty soon found herself in a popular clubhouse filled with all manner of people. It was a place she had never been to. It was while she stood inside looking lost that she received a text asking her to come to a particular room upstairs. It was in there that she met Todd. 
he observed that she was not as excited as before, and when he asked her what the matter was, she said she was only really sad that he would be leaving. He seemed to fall for the lie even though she was afraid as every other person who was alone with a murderer would. After she gave him the money, he wanted something more. He wanted what he had long desired. But this was something that she didn't bargain for, so she told him that she needed to go home before they realized that she had been gone for too long. He wasn't buying this now. This was the last time that he was ever going to set his eyes on her, and he would have his way, one way or another. He reached for her and forcefully started taking off her clothes. When she resisted, he hit her really hard, and that was when the tracker fell off. Todd was furious. He knew that Patty was a means of getting to him. He immediately pulled a gun. But before he could pull the trigger, the cops broke into the room, and a gunfight ensued. He was shot multiple times to the head, and he was pronounced dead on the spot. But not after a shot fired by him, hit Patty on her chest. We all waited in the hospital for the doctor's verdict. When he came out of the theater, he said that Patty would live. The bullet had missed her heart. She was stabilized. We felt great relief. The fear of losing Patty was had cast a shadow of gloom over all of us, but now, we were grateful for the light of hope shining. Patty returned home three months later. To celebrate her return, I sensitized the girls in my school on the need for self-love and emotional maturity. By 2021, I would set up a GoFundMe account for Patty that will enable us to generate the funds to reach out to more girls. Hey guys, what would you do if you were me? What would you do if you were me? What would you do if you were me? What would How I milked my neighbor's goat in 10 minutes. Hi guys, I am K.H. Lowe, and if you ever met anyone crazier than I, it was I I consider myself fun to be with it you are can actually get crazy with me. I would take up adventures simply because it was just an adventure. For reasons which I can't properly understand, I have always had a level of curiosity you don't get to see in most people you meet on a daily. Some say curiosity killed the cat, well for K.H. Lowe, curiously was her life wire. The very thing that kept her going. My curiosity always gave me something new to focus on and a direction in which I could channel my energy. I would swim through land or walk on water just to find answers about certain things that puzzled me and trust me, I always had questions. My head seems to always question the reason why things were the way they were. The cause and effect of certain actions taken. This has made me learn by experience a thousand ways things don't work. For instance, one time while I was just three years old, I got surprised when I closely observed that a newly wedded couple that was our next-door neighbor. I could tell her stomach of the wife was increasingly getting bigger than Mummy's own. This gave me quite a great bit of concern because Mummy was older than her and by default should have the bigger stomach. While I was still trying to put pieces together, I discovered that the size was no more as big as it was but she now carried a child smaller than myself. I couldn't help it anymore and so I walked up to Mummy who seemed rather happy this woman was beating her to the belly race. Mummy, from where did she get the baby? I inquired. She got it from within her Mummy said. Who put it within her? I further asked. Well, she has always had it within her, she just decided to bring it out now Mummy replied, cleverly avoiding details that were not fit for a five-year-old. I wasn't satisfied and it was no new knowledge that I won't leave until my curiosity had been satisfied and my questions answered. How did she bring it out? Does she still have any more left in her? While Mummy was still figuring out a way of escape, I gave the final blow can you bring out a baby for me now? At this point, a dad who was amused and thrilled altogether by the uncommon intelligence displayed by me just like other times burst out laughing as he picked me up from the ground. Yes, when Mummy is ready, she will bring out one, he said while passing her a naughty glance. Though my curiosity was still not satisfied yet, I had the promise of a baby which I eagerly now looked forward to and so I let the sleeping dog lie. Children have a knack for imitating what they see others do. Well, K.H. Lowe was not your regular kid. If I wasn't imitating what I had seen, I was initiating what I had imagined. This lesson my parents learned very early and so while great caution was taken when doing certain things while I was around, they equally paid close attention when I was on my own because I was always up to something. Fast forward to a year later and I had my fourth birthday party being celebrated. It was usually fun, and this time was no different. The colorful event had neighbors, friends, and well-wishers come over. While they sang the traditional happy birthday song, my eyes were fixed on the four lit candles which I was expected to blow out. And as you will rightly guess, I had questions. One of the reasons you would want to avoid my questions is because I usually paid attention to details others might pass on as insignificant. I won't say that I have a photographic memory but I clearly remember that during last year's birthday celebration, 
I had just three wax candles to blow out. But now they were four. One thing I find fascinating is the fact that I was never allowed to eat them. What in the world were candles doing on a cake when you are not allowed to eat them? Did they make the cake sweeter? Why were they now four? I could have gone on a quest to get answers from mummy and daddy almost immediately. But it was my birthday party and they were all over the place and I won't get the attention I needed. If I was going to get answers, I would have to find them myself and so I began to hatch a plan. The taste of the pudding has got to be in the eating so if you ever come around and get served something nice with candles in it, the whole credit shouldn't be given to mum because your baby girl equally paid the cooking pot a visit. Standing in front of the mirror, I had never been more proud and excited. The holidays were over and today was resumption day. Mum and dad would finally heave temporal sighs of relief as I'll be away from home for a few hours. I was already 16 and from all indications, I got wilder and more inquisitive with age. Mom had finally fulfilled the promise of bringing out a baby two times over. Keeping up with my siblings was not really going to be a difficult task. No, they already dealt with K.H. Lowe. Unlike me, my two siblings were just regular kids who were only intrigued by things they saw but lost interest immediately they saw something else. Yea, they were easily distracted but it was going to be easy keeping them on a leash. I was quite popular in school. I don't really know how I do it but it just seemed real easy making my presence felt. One way or another, K.H. Lowe would always happen. I had no issues making friends. If you could get crazy, then we could be besties. Teachers knew me for me. Quite a few had noted that they were always glad when rounding up a lesson. I asked questions that kept them on their toes. Don't get me wrong, even though my questions could seem and sound naughty. They didn't stem from a motive to cause mischief but from a desire to learn. If I have already painted the picture of a girl who always came out of every adventure decked in glory, then please accept my apology. Curiosity like most things has got its pros and cons, and for a girl who was always on the go, I got into some kind of trouble every now and then. Most times, they were life-threatening and other times, they just simply created foes. I have had to be rescued from a fire incident started by me. A friend had to be rushed to the emergency room all because she joined me in an expedition that didn't really come out as planned. In a church, at a party, in school, and everywhere K.H. Lowe has been. I have had an unfair share of being criticized more than celebrated. Whenever K.H. Lowe happened, it was really easy to see me as a kid without a proper home upbringing who was sore on the skin of everyone especially her parents but if I pull off a stunt that ends well. My parents were considered fortunate to have me in the family. We have had visitors come to our home at odd times, some came to plead with my parents to keep me far from their children, others came to issue warnings to me right in front of my parents. Well, it never really bothered me the least bit. I always try to be K.H. Low and there are times it's synonymous with danger and destruction or glory and fame. So when next you seem to envy me, just remember that there are always two sides to a coin. Like every other student, I did have certain subjects that easily appealed to me. One of which was biology. Each topic just gave me so many avenues for adventure. So now you can understand my excitement when the first teacher to step into the class was the biology teacher. She immediately had my attention when she announced that we were going to study the reproductive system of animals. No sooner had she said so did I find myself walking the part of a pleasurable memory lane. It all started at the end of last semester when our final topic was the human reproductive system and reproduction. I had listened with rapt attention as she explained the steps involved taken before reproduction can occur. This was really a bad time to become K.H. Lowe but it was too late. I'm always K.H. Lowe. I then realized I was just like mom and the neighbor, I equally had babies in me. Now it wouldn't hurt to bring out one, would it? Of course, now I know that it takes two to tango, I needed someone willing to tango. The holidays were around the corner and I didn't know if I could utilize it. A three-day visit to Granny was all the opportunity I would get. It was actually a tradition for us to pay Granny a visit every end of the year. There we had our Thanksgiving as a family. We got to know some cousins who we'll never think about once we left. Grandma was not Granny in every sense of the word. She was a 75-year-old woman who still had the strength of a 50-year-old and had always been an ardent advocate of morality and discipline. Arrangements were made when she turned 65 to get someone to assist her but she vehemently opposed it. She hated to think of herself as being so vulnerable she would need a helper. A blow from arthritis at age 70 had her reconsidering her stance. This was when Dave was introduced into the scene. 
a grumpy 12-year-old who just sat around waiting for instructions. Not much is known about Dave's past except that he was the fifth child of a woman who had six children for different men. His mom lived a promiscuous life, and she took in for several men who either denied being responsible for the pregnancy or abandoned her to raise the kids alone as some of them were already married with kids. This further led her into prostitution as a means of livelihood. She learned by experience that being a single mom barely had any advantage as she was now plagued with a level of poverty so intense that the kids were neglected. When it became apparent that the income she generated through her trade was not going to be enough for her and the kids, she decided to initiate those old enough into one vice or the other. For the two girls who just became teens, she would often send them to spend the night with various men, and they would return with the proceeds by daybreak. They were quickly exposed to the lifestyle of sex and drugs. The boys were not spared either. Once they were old enough to run, she sent them out to the streets to go pickpocketing. The home quickly became an abode for criminals. While Dave turned three years, his mom sexually contracted a deadly disease and passed away. Now being orphaned at an early age, he was sent into the orphanage home pending when foster parents were willing to adopt him. Although the kind of lifestyle Dave experienced in his home was not really present at the orphanage, the orphanage was no kinder to him. The matrons placed over the children always diverted the funds and foodstuffs donated by well-meaning individuals and firms and this caused the children to be malnourished and neglected to a great extent. The kids soon got used to the lifestyle of survival of the fittest. Bullying was a constant feature in the house, and it was no news when you heard that a kid had run away from the home. If brought back to the orphanage, the kid was made to face severe punishments just to make sure he never repeated the act. Dave ran away twice. The first time was when he was seven years of age, and the second time was when he was about clocking twelve in three days. It was while my dad was at the orphanage making inquiries about the adoption process that he saw Dave being led back into the home. The look on the faces of other children suggested that Dave was in for a treatment he knew too well. There was just something about the whole scene that daddy could relate to. Upon further inquiry about Dave, he saw so much of himself in Dave that he decided that he, Dave, fit the profile of the individual grandma needed around. Of course, Dave would need to have some work done on him, but Dad was convinced Grandma was well-suited to handle Dave. After all, she did a good job on him years back. And Dave was really no different. He was just going through the same things Dad experienced years ago. My dad was the first of three children, all from the same couple. He was the product of pure love between two couples. Unlike Dave, he knew his father and had the temporal privilege of enjoying a father's love. He was full of life until his father lost his life in a ghastly motor accident. At the age of six, he had become fatherless. His mom tried all she could to fill up the space created by her husband. She took up multiple jobs and even turned down a couple of suitors who had proposed marriage because she felt that they might not totally love her kids. The demands of her jobs occasionally made her unavoidably absent from the life of her kids and this began to affect them negatively. Dad soon becomes an object of ridicule in class. He was not spared the torments of bullies, and this further caused a decline in his grade. He gradually became a recluse, cutting off from the rest of the world when he still had a lot to offer. The kid who was once full of energy and positivity, now battled with low self-esteem. He saw himself amounting to nothing and thought that he would die soon. A thought that he saw as a relief since it would put an end to his misery. Grandma often came home late at night and was always too tired to check up on how the day went for the kids so it took a while before she noticed the mess she had made. She immediately began making adjustments by cutting down her work hours, visiting the kids in school twice a week, and spending more time with them at home. As soon as Dad started getting the reassurance of his mother's love, he began standing up to the bullies in school because he knew his mom would show up to his defense as she once did when she confronted a bully who regularly picked up on Dad. She reported the matter to the school authorities and the boy was suspended for a while. As time went by, Grandma rebuilt his confidence and self-esteem. She made him always seek something positive in any negative circumstance. Thanks to Grandma's resilience, Dad turned out great, and he knew she could do the same for Dave. Making our way to the front porch of Granny's house, we were greeted by the now 17-year-old Dave who although was far from being a fine gentleman, was now so full of life. It was no surprise. Grandma's recipe had worked just as Mom and Dad said it would. It always worked. It worked on Dad and it helped shape him into a man very conscious of how limited time is. Although Dave was so eager to please everyone, it was the night before we left that I paid attention to him. 
I was actually keeping him at arm's length because there was really nothing about him that appealed to me. The house was finally crowned as uncles came with their families. This time you're alone, we had five babies added to the family. The rooms were filled up and the kids were made to share the same room with Dave. Deep into the night, you could hear the little babies crying in the other room and while it kept me from falling asleep. Everyone else had dozed off or so I thought. The babies reminded me of the reproduction lessons we had had and my desire to explore. While I tried taking my mind off it, Dave sleepily crossed his hand over me laying it on my belly. I made to brush his hand aside but that became my undoing as it glazed the tip of my breasts. That sent a sweet tingling sensation running down my body and I had to now move my body in a rhythmic fashion to ensure a repetition of body contact. Before long, I felt something rock hard poking and rubbing me. In no time I found myself guiding his hands down a warm, moist, and slippery path which felt so good. I then wondered why my teacher skipped the part where you find yourself on the moon. A shout from grandma was what it took to end a journey that had barely begun. She had fallen down while making her way to the restroom. We were all surrounding her in no time, and she had to be rushed to the clinic where she was admitted for the night and mom and Dave had to stay with her. By morning, she was declared all right but advised to rest a lot. Dad picked up mom grandma and Dave from the clinic before taking us back home. I was really frustrated as I had some unfinished business. Standing on the porch and waving goodbye as daddy drove off was Dave who I was certain couldn't wait for the next Thanksgiving. I may not have completed this expedition but it gave me a renewed passion to seize the opportunity when next it came. Wherever it came, back to the classroom, the lesson was delivered as expected. We specifically learned about the reproduction of a goat and how it breastfed its kid. The whole class was almost thrown into a frenzy at some point when the teacher mentioned that a kid wasn't the only one who took goat milk. Humans equally did. You could literally see the look of disgust on our faces. It was very difficult putting the pieces together. If we took the same milk the goats did, can we be called goats? Why don't we have the same horn they had? Why don't we walk on all fours just as they did? Why don't we bleat the same way they did? Can we eat the grass they ate and still stay healthy? The teacher very well knew that he had some questions to answer but he wanted to keep us anticipating the next class so he decided not to take questions today. I've never had the patience to wait for an answer. You either give it to me now or I get it now. I wasn't going to let this pass and you could bet on it. I needed to know if I belonged to the family of goats. Immediately I got home I headed straight for my laptop. It was one of the tools which aided me in fact findings. I started surfing the web looking for goats and answers. After a few minutes, it became clear. Humans actually consume goat milk but it passed through processes that made it safe for us. Wow, I was glad I wasn't a goat. Curiosity further led me into watching how this goat milk was obtained. I watched the milking process. It looked very easy and I knew that I could do it. I knew I would do it. This time, I won't need a partner. I only need a goat. For the very first time in a long time, I almost believed I had run out of ideas. How was I going to lay my hands on a goat? Every possible means seemed to have its own hurdle. I couldn't visit the zoo just to milk a goat. I couldn't suddenly ask mom and dad to get me a goat as a pet. We already had three dogs which regularly made messes I had to clean up while fuming with rage. They would definitely know that I was up to something and I am not keen on bringing them in on my next point of gender. The only option remaining on my list happened to be Mrs. Coker. A neighbor whom I disliked. I may be overreacting but she always seemed more creepy and less friendly to me. Her constant smiles wouldn't make me budge on my stance. She was a 40-year-old divorcee with a daughter my age and rather than remarry, chose to surround herself with various kinds of animals for pets. Well, I doubt she had suitors who wanted to marry her. She looked like a goat and weighed like a cow, and although she didn't have suitors, she had cows. Goats, horses, dogs, chickens, and kittens. Her home was like a mini zoo, but if I ever get to milk a goat, it was going to be hers. There were stories of her past that we were not sure were false. Rumor had it that most of the women in her family didn't have stable homes. Her grandmother was a divorcee, and so was her mum. She grew up in a home that was filled with abuse. She had watched as mother always got in an argument with her father, who ended up beating her most of the time. Her dad soon began bringing other ladies into the house just because he claimed that his wife who nags a lot has refused to get intimate with him since they last had an argument. 
it was said that rather than cry, try to make up with her husband, her mum now decided to return the favor by equally bringing men into the home just to have sex with them. She often paid these men who were sometimes younger than her. Her husband decided to get a divorce from her when he once walked in on her making love with a man. And they were both naked. Mrs. Coker had seen all this, and it had quite an impact on her. She saw marriage as a thing to be dreaded. She made up her mind never to get married, but at the age of 25, she saw herself in the home of a widower who had proposed to marry her after she got raped. And impregnated. Not wanting to face life alone with a child by her side, she reluctantly accepted, but things didn't work out as she thought. The widower was a man who refused to bring anything to the table. He just exploited Mrs. Coker. It was when he beat her up for refusing to give him the money she didn't have, that she knew that she would be better off alone with her daughter. She divorced him and decided to start rearing animals as a means of dealing with the loneliness she felt. Mrs. Coker became a farmer who randomly shared her proceeds with the neighbors on weekends. She didn't have any mouth to feed except her daughter Meg, and so, you would often see them hand in gloves. Going to families to distribute eggs, milk, or some dairy produce. She was loved by all except me, and whenever I was greeted by their smiles, I returned them with a scripted grin. Parents would sometimes drop off their children with them and they took no small delight in teaching them practical agriculture. This was the part I wanted. Practical agriculture. Practically milking a goat, but if I was going to be a student, I would need to like the teachers, or at least pretend to. Her daughter took after her in looks, and size, and eventually surpassed her mom. She looked like a goat, weighed like a cow, ate like a horse, and drank like a camel. In fact, it seemed as though anything she did, was done in excess. An attitude that I found really offensive. In class, she ate in excess, laughed in excess, played in excess, and fought in excess. The only thing she never had in excess was good grades. You could say she failed in excess. At one time, she seized every opportunity to get close to me, but she wasn't the kind of friend I wanted. I love people who are crazy, not stupid. Desperate times call for desperate measures, and it was clear that I had to now extend a hand of friendship if I was ever going to get near the goats. Without wasting time, I started executing my plan the next day in school. It wasn't difficult finding an opportunity as I knew she always never did her assignments at home. She had to copy it from someone else in school. I was going to save her today. I gave her my book which she hastily took, and that began our friendship. While she saw me as an escape route to better grades, I saw her as the path that leads to the goats. This sudden relationship progressed at a very quick pace and she soon started coming over to our house so we could do the assignments which we were given in school. As you would rightly guess, I did the assignments and just copied them. Before long, she became a regular visitor at our home, and although my mom and dad were very much surprised as everyone else was, they were not against the friendship as it meant we received more agricultural produce. You could call me a manipulator, but I was getting close to my goal. And besides our relationship was mutually beneficial to everyone involved. I was helping her get good grades, and it was only fair she helped me get some good milk. Did I really like her personality? No, I didn't. Was she ever going to be more than access to milking the goats? I don't know. What happens to the relationship after I get the milk? I don't know. Time will tell. When I got to that bridge, then I would figure out how to cross it. Meg didn't show up in class on a Thursday and word soon got out that she had taken ill. On getting home, I informed my parents about it together. We all went to visit her. It turned out that she had caught a cold but it wasn't so serious. The doctor advised that she took out time to rest, and this meant that she had to stay away from the animals. We weren't the only ones who came visiting, but as her friend, I quickly made myself feel at home. The animals were yet to be fed that evening and I readily offered to help Mrs. Coker feed them. My parents left without me as I was still tending to the animals while Mrs. Coker received the visitors. And tended to Meg. When it was time to leave, Mrs. Coker was very grateful that I came around as she was already too busy to tend to the animals. I told her it was no big deal. I was just being there for a friend. I promised to come by every day to check up on Meg and help feed the animals. My parents were really impressed with the attitude I displayed, and they commended me for it. I eagerly anticipated my arrival at the Coker Farm residence. I was greeted by the ever-smiling farm owner, who couldn't hide her excitement at my arrival. I went to check up on Meg who was observing a bed rest just as the doctor advised. 
I needed to bring her up to speed on what has been going on in school before I'll feed the animals. While I was discussing with Meg, her mom interrupted us, saying that she had to go down to the pharmacy to pick up the drugs the doctor prescribed for Meg. Immediately she left, I rounded up my session with Meg and headed straight for the animals. I quickly attended to the other animals but saved the goat for last. Upon finishing with the other animals, I realized that I had a few minutes before Mrs. Coker arrived and put a stop to my escapade. This was the moment I had been waiting for and I wasn't going to wait any longer. I quickly rushed over to the section where the goats were kept, and without much thought, I descended on the first goat I could lay my hands on. It seemed harder than I thought as I found it difficult to get the goat to release some milk. I was doing exactly what I had seen in the video which I watched, or so I thought. I finally reached a milestone in the tenth minute when the goat released a gluey substance. But my joy was short-lived after I examined the substance and it didn't look like the milk I had seen. Then I froze when I discovered that I was in a hurry that I forgot to check the gender of the goat. Oh my god, this was a male goat. I was mad. Have I come all this way for nothing? Did I unwillingly enter into a relationship with the cokers all for nothing? Did I tend to the sick and had all her assignments done all for nothing? What was I going to do? Do I immediately start all over again? I knew it was not possible because Mrs. Coker was probably on her way back. I had ruined my opportunity to milk a goat and I didn't know when next it was going to come. I didn't know when next Meg would fall ill and her mom would leave her in my care to go and get drugs. Another thought seemed better. What if I just opened up to Mrs. Coker that I would love to milk a goat, that way? I would not have to be looking over my shoulders or hoping that someone gets ill. Hey guys, what will you do if you were me? Would you continue with the friendship that you never really wanted? I would love to know your thoughts about it. How Anita did the unthinkable even while she was still in love with her fiancé. Cheating is as old as humans. Some partners take it lightly while others go the extra mile to pay their cheating partners. This story talks about how two partners who loved themselves from the beginning eventually became strangers. The fiancé was doing his own thing while the fiancé was also doing her own thing. They were living under the same roof but they had a different ideology. Sit back, relax and enjoy this story. I met Chris when I traveled to London for holiday. It was the norm in my family then to always go on holiday towards the end of every year. In 2017, my dad decided that we should travel to London because my mom and I have not been to London before. Our holiday to London coincided with the time the London Derby was about to be played. We arrived in London on Thursday and the London Derby was to be played on Sunday. The City of London was very lively in anticipation of the London Derby between Chelsea Football Club and Arsenal Football Club. I asked my dad if that is how the streets of London are every time the London Derby was around the corner. My dad said there are many teams in London like Chelsea Football Club, Arsenal Football Club, Tottenham Football Club, and West Ham Football Club. He said these teams are all in the first tier of English football which means they play each other regularly. He said there are other London teams in the second tier of English football too. He said none of the London derbies comes close to Arsenal versus Chelsea. He said the street will still witness more activities on Serian Sunday. The background of the teams that I heard from my dad made me fall in love with the city and the teams. I told my dad to book a ticket for all of us to watch the London Derby. I said I didn't want to miss any of the actions in the stadium because if the city is as lively as we saw, then the stadium will be more than what we were witnessing on the streets of London. My dad promised to book the ticket for the whole family when we settle in our hotel. We lodged into the Prime Hotel. My dad paid for seven days because our holiday was supposed to last for seven days. As soon as we settled down, I reminded my dad about the tickets. My dad asked me why I was eager to watch the match because he doesn't know me as a lover of football. I told him I wasn't much interested in the football itself, I am more interested in what will happen at the stadium. As soon as my dad booked the ticket, I went to my room while I left him and my mom in their room. I was very tired because of the long journey from the United States to London. While I lied on my bed, I could still hear the noise of the fans outside the hotel. I watched them through my window before I finally retired to my bed. I woke up the next day intending to tour the whole city. I went to my dad's room and I told him that he has to take me to major places around the city of London. My dad agreed to take me around the city of London. He said we should take our breakfast first. He said after taking our breakfast, we can rest a little bit before going out. I went back to my room to take my bath. After taking my bath, I joined my mom and dad in their room where we had breakfast. After breakfast, 
My dad called a taxi that would take us around the city of London. My dad bargained with the taxi man and he agreed to drive us for the whole day at the rate of $300. Emirate Stadium which is the venue of the London Derby was the first place we visited. We were taken through various buildings in the stadium. We were taken to the dressing room of the players, the training pitch, the volleyball pitch, and the trophy cabinet. We left the Emirate Stadium and moved to Stamford Bridge which is the stadium of Chelsea Football Club. We were taken through the stadium's building including the training pitch, the volleyball pitch, the track, and field stadium, and the trophy cabinet. Fortunately, the Chelsea Football Club players were having their final training session before the London Derby. So we stood there and watched them. After the training, we took pictures with some of the players and the coach. We left the Stamford Bridge Stadium and moved to the Tower of London. The Tower of London is one of the world's most famous buildings. We went through all the rooms in the building. From the Tower of London, we moved to the Emirate Airline Cable Car. The Emirate Airline Cable Car provides a stunning view of the city departing every 30 seconds from the Greenwich Peninsula and the Royal Docks. From the Emirate Airline Cable, we moved to the London Transport Museum. The London Transport Museum hosts an exhibition connecting transport with the social and cultural history of London. We saw more than 80 vehicles spanning 200 years of London's history including a Red Route Master Bus and the world's first underground steam train. We ended our tour at the Warner Bros. Studio. At the Warner Bros. Studio, we saw first handsets, costumes, and props used in the Harry Potter films. We were taken into some of the film locations including the Great Hall, Dumbledore's office, and Hagrid's hut. After taking a tour of the Warner Bros. Studio, we entered into our taxi and headed back to our hotel. We arrived at our hotel at exactly 9.15 p.m. My dad paid the taxi driver and we went into our hotel room. Days passed by and we continued to enjoy our stay in London. On say which was a day before the showdown, Chelsea Football Club supporters and Arsenal Football Clan supporters held a rally at different points in London. Chelsea supporters held their rally in front of Stamford Bridge while Arsenal fans held their own in front of Emirates Stadium. We joined Chelsea's rally because our hotel was closer to Stamford Bridge than Emirates Stadium. The D-Day arrived. The match was scheduled to hold at 2 p.m. but my dad told me that we have to prepare to leave the hotel by 10 or 11 a.m. because of the crowd that will be in front of the stadium. As soon as I heard that from my dad, I rushed to my room to take my bath while my dad entered his bathroom too. My mom went to the kitchen to prepare a light breakfast. By the time my dad and I finished taking our bath, breakfast was ready. My mom had already eaten her breakfast. She left breakfast on the table while she went to the bathroom to take her bath. By the time my mom finished taking her bath, my dad and I had finished eating breakfast. While we were taking our breakfast, my dad had already called the taxi driver that took us on tour. The taxi driver arrived at 10.25. He called my dad that he was already in front of our hotel. We left our room and joined him. On our way to the stadium, we met different people with different costumes on the road. Arsenal fans had red costumes while Chelsea fans had blue costumes. We arrived at the Emirate Stadium at exactly 11.15 a.m. A journey that was not more than 20 minutes became 45 minutes because of the number of people on the road. When we arrived at the Emirate Stadium, we joined a queue of more than 200 people. The attendants were checking everybody's ticket with a computer because they wanted to prevent forgery. After about an hour and 30 minutes, it got to our turn. My dad presented his ticket, my mom's ticket, and my ticket to the attendant for checking. It took the attendant more than 10 minutes to confirm our ticket. We gained access to the stadium at exactly 1 p.m. When we entered the stadium, we began another round of searches. Because of the population of fans in the stadium, it was difficult to find a seat. Ten minutes into our search, we finally got a seat close to a man. But we had a problem because the seats we got were two and we were three. I raised my head a little bit and I saw a seat close to a guy. My mom and dad sat on the two seats while I went to the vacant seat that was close to the guy. The atmosphere in the stadium was electrifying. I was enjoying every bit of it. The atmosphere of the stadium is what I wanted to see and I was enjoying it. At exactly 3 p.m., the players came out for the warm-up. They were received by huge applause from fans of both teams. While I was shouting and cheering both teams, I noticed that the guy that was sitting close to me was looking at me. Every time our eyes met, he would take look another way as if he was not looking at me. I was just smiling because I understood him perfectly. At exactly 3.20 a.m., the players returned to the dressing to fully prepare for the match. When the players walked back into the dressing room, the atmosphere of the stadium became a little bit relaxed. The noise from both fans went down a little bit. The guy that was sitting close to me felt that was the opportunity he needed to have a conversation with me. He finally summoned the courage to talk to me. He looked at me and said he has been enjoying how I have been cheering both teams. He asked me which of the teams that am I a fan of. I told him that I am not a fan of any of the team. He looked very surprised when he heard that. 
I told him that I am not even a football lover. I told him I had just come to the city with my family to have some fun. I told him that it was the mood of the city that drove me to the stadium. I told him how everywhere in the city was in a carnival mod when I arrived in London. I said it was the mood of the city that made me ask my dad what was happening, and he told me that was how the city usually comes to life when it's time for the London Derby. You could see the surprise on his face when I was talking. He asked for my name and I told him that my name is Anita. He told me that his name is Joseph. He asked me where I came from and I told him that I came all the from the United States with my family to have fun. Joseph smiled when I told him that I came from the United States. I saw the smile on his face which prompted me to ask why he was smiling. He said he is also from the United States. I asked him which state does is he from and he said he lives in Alabama. I smiled also. I told him my family and I live in Georgia. I told him my family and I visit Alabama frequently because we have a family friend there. Joseph asked me when I will be returning to the United States. I told him that our holiday is supposed to last for seven days and we have spent four days already. I said it means we will be going back to the United States in the next three days. Joseph said he came to London for a project and the project will last for 14 days. He said he will be returning to the United States after the completion of the project. While Joseph and I were having a conversation, the players began to walk onto the pitch. At that point, Joseph and I could not hear each other because the stadium has erupted. The noise was too much for us to hear ourselves. Joseph told me that we should enjoy the football because once the match begins, the noise will be louder than what we are hearing. Five minutes after the players walked onto the pitch, the match began. Chelsea Football Club had the better possession in the five minutes. They looked threatening in front of the goal, but the Arsenal defence was resolute. Twenty minutes into the match, Chelsea Football Club took the lead through Eden Hazard. The Chelsea supporters club took over the pitch. You could hear their noise loudly even though Arsenal Football Club was the home team. 45 minutes after, the referee blew the whistle for the end of the first half. While the players were walking down the tunnel, a lot of spectators also left their seats to get some refreshment. Joseph and I continued our conversation because the noise reduced drastically. Joseph sarcastically told me that we have only 15 minutes to talk because the players will back on the pitch after 15 minutes. Joseph said what we can talk about in 15 minutes. I told him that we cannot have any meaningful discussion in 15 minutes. He asked me for my cell phone number and I gave him to him. He asked me if we could see before I travel back to the United States. I told him I do not think it will be possible because, after the match, my parent and I will head back to our hotel. I said we can only be talking on the phone. I said if he returns to the United States after his project, we will have time to talk to each other. Fifteen minutes after the players left the pitch, they returned to the pitch for the second half. Twelve minutes into the second half, Arsenal Football Club equalized through Theo Walcott. The home fans got their voice back. Eighty-four minutes into the match, Arsenal got the winning through Theo Walcott again. The home fans were in a jubilant mood. The away stand became silent as they started sensing defeat. At exactly 95 minutes, the referee blew the whistle for the end of the match. Arsenal Football Club players and coaches came to the fans to celebrate with them. While the celebration was going on, Joseph told me he was leaving. He said he has something important to attend to. My father also decided that we have had enough fun. He said we should return to our hotel to rest. He said the taxi driver was already waiting for us outside. Exiting the stadium was not easy because of the crowd. After about 10 minutes of finding our way, we were able to exit the stadium and join our taxi. Getting to our hotel was also not easy because there were a lot of cars on the road. After about one and a half hours on the road, we arrived at our hotel. We were all tired, so we all went into our rooms. The next morning we were in our rooms throughout the day. We didn't go out like we used to. We spent the rest of our holidays most in our hotel room. A day before our departure day, I did some laundry with my mom. We packed our entire luggage and prepared for our departure the next day. My dad woke me up at exactly 5 a.m. on Sunday because he didn't want us to miss our flight. We all took our baths and headed to the airport in our usual taxi. We got to Georgia at exactly 2 p.m. By 3 p.m., we were in our house. When we got home, Joseph was the first person I called. I told him that we just landed in the United States. Joseph was very happy for me. He said he will also be in the United States in a few days. He said he can't wait to meet me when he lands in the United States. I graduated from high school a few weeks before we traveled to London. I have been at home ever since I graduated because the admission into college was not out. I approached my father that night and I told him I want to learn how to play volleyball. I told him rather than sitting at home doing nothing, engaging myself in volleyball will be better. My father accepted and he told me that he will take me to a volleyball center for registration the next day. My father woke me very early the next day because he wanted to take me to the volleyball center on his way to work. 
I took my bath very quickly and I joined him in the car. We got to the volleyball center around 7 a.m. We met a lot of volleyball players who came for training. We were directed to the office of the management for official registration. After registration, I was given all the kits I need for training. I joined other ladies on the pitchy while my dad drove to his office. The training ended at 11 a.m. After the training, the coach addressed all players. He introduced me to all of them. He said he wants me to put a lot of effort into becoming a fantastic volleyball player. After the address, I left the center and headed home. As soon as I got home, I took my bath and I went straight into the kitchen because I was very hungry. Every morning, I joined my father in his car to the center. The population of players kept increasing every day which gave room for competition. A few weeks into my training, I started getting a lot of recognition. After training on Friday, we were told that we have a volleyball match against Titan Queens on Sunday. The coach said we should all listen to the names of that have been selected for the match. When the coach mentioned my name, I was very happy. When I got home, I told my mom that she has to come and watch. I called my dad on phone and I told him too. They all agreed to come and watch me play volleyball. I was the first person to wake up on Sunday. We were told to come for early morning training before the match. I went to my parents' door to inform them of my movement. I told them that the match was slated for 11 a.m., therefore, they should wait till 10.30 a.m. before leaving the house. I waved them goodbye and I left. When I got to the center, the coach and some players were already there. We did our training before we headed to the team hotel to rest. At exactly 10 a.m., we left the team hotel and returned to the center. The opposing team arrived around that time too, so we had a familiarity walk with them. At exactly 10.45, we went back into the dressing room to change into our jerseys. Five minutes after, we were told to walk onto the pitch by the referee. As I was walking onto the court, I saw my mom and my dad in the stand. We won the match by a wide margin. I played the best game of my life. At the end of the match, I was voted for as the best player. My parents were very happy with my performance. I took pictures with them, my coach, my teammates, and the players from the opposing team. On our way home, my dad could not contain his joy. He said he was happy with how proud I made him. He said I should take my volleyball training seriously. He said I should not hesitate to come to him if I need anything that will enhance my volleyball training. When we got home, my dad told my mom to prepare a very delicious meal for dinner. He said he wants her to prepare a meal that we will all enjoy. He ordered expensive wines from the local mall near us. Our house was in a carnival mood that day. We ate to our satisfaction. We took some of the food to our neighbors. I went to bed that night feeling like a queen. Not even my graduation from high school got me this emotional. I called Joseph and informed him of how I made everybody in my home proud today. Joseph was very happy too. He said he will be in the United States the next Sunday. He said what I did calls for celebration and we will celebrate it together. Seven days after, Joseph was back in the United States. I was the first person he called when he arrived. He told me how stressful his journey was and how tiring his project was. After talking about his trip and his project, Joseph said he will like us to meet on Tuesday. He said he would have chosen Monday, but he needs a lot of rest. I obliged his request. Around 7 p.m. on Monday, I called Joseph to ask him where we were going to meet and the time we are to meet. He said we should meet at his house by noon. I had the intention of skipping my volleyball practice before I called him, but his response changed my mind. If we were to meet by noon, then I can go to my volleyball training before going to see him. I woke up at exactly 6 a.m. on Tuesday. I joined my father in his car. He dropped me at my training center while he drove to work. Normally, our training usually ends by 11 a.m., but I told my coach that I have an important thing to attend to. Therefore, I have to live by 10 a.m. I left training at 10, 0 a.m. and I got home by 10.30 a.m. I took my bath and I came to the kitchen to eat my breakfast. After taking my breakfast, I called Joseph and I told him I was on my way. I left the house at 11 a.m. I was fortunate to get a taxi in front of our house. The taxi dropped me in front of Joseph's house around 11.50 a.m. When the taxi dropped me, I called Joseph and I told him to come and pick me in front of his house. A few seconds later, Joseph came out and we both entered his house. Joseph's apartment was very nice. He had the latest electronics in his house. I told him that I like what I saw. I said that is how a house should be. Joseph was just smiling at me. He asked me what he should offer me. I told him that I ate before I left my house. Because I didn't want him to have a feeling that I don't want to take anything in his house. I told him to give me a bottle of wine. He went to the fridge and brought the bottle of wine. He dropped the wine in front of me and sat close to me on the couch. I was wondering why he sat very close to me. Joseph said he has not been himself since the first day he saw me at the Emirates Stadium. 
He said since then, he has been thinking of sitting close to me again like he is doing presently. Joseph said he loves me and he wants to spend the rest of his life with me. He didn't give me a chance to talk. Before I could say anything, Joseph's hands were already in my cloth and his lips were on my lips. He was kissing me with his lips while he was using his hand to caress every part of my body. He was touching me where I wanted to be touched. I kept moaning as his hands were going through all my body. When he noticed that I could not take him anymore, he carried me to his bed and we continued from where we stopped. We had great sex which lasted for more than two hours. After the sex, both of us entered the bathroom to freshen up. After taking my bath, I entered the kitchen to cook what we were going to eat because we were all hungry. In 30 minutes, the food was ready. We ate together. The kissing continued while we were eating, but I told Joseph that we cannot have sex again that day. I left Joseph's house at around 5 p.m. I got home feeling excited because it has been a long time since I had sex. The last time I had sex was when I was in high school. The sex I had then cannot be compared to what Joseph gave me. It was the best sex I have ever had. Days went by and our relationship became stronger. We began to do a lot of things together. I go to his house regularly and he comes to our house regularly too. Everybody in the neighborhood began to see us together frequently. Those we were hiding our relationship for when we started now know that something is happening between the both of us. Six months into our relationship, Joseph invited me to the cinema. He said he wants me to watch the new movie released by Van Damme. When we got to the cinema, we met a lot of people who came to watch the movie. The movie was making waves, so everybody was trooping to the cinema to watch the movie. When we finally got our ticket, I was about to enter the hall when Joseph held my hand tightly. The next thing I saw was that Joseph was on the ground with his two knees. I was still wondering what Joseph was trying to do until I saw a ring in his hand. Joseph proposed to me in front of the crowd. I was speechless because everybody in the cinema was looking at us. I became shy and I didn't know what to say. I summoned the courage to say yes to his proposal. After the proposal, we went into the hall to watch the movie. After watching the movie, I rushed home to show my mom the ring Joseph gave me. My mom could not believe it. She was so happy for me. She prayed for me and encouraged me to do the right things. One month after Joseph proposed to me, I thought it was right for me to move to his apartment and start staying with him since we will be getting married soon. I told my parents about it and they agreed. I called Joseph and told him about it and he agreed too. Since everybody was in support of what I wanted to do, I felt it was right for me to do it. I finally moved into Joseph's apartment and we started living like couples. We did almost everything together. The love we had for each other became stronger than it was before. A few weeks after I moved in with Joseph, I started noticing strange behaviors from him. He started doing things that he did not use to do before. He started coming home late, sometimes he won't even come home at all. He started ignoring my calls when he is at work and he doesn't eat when he gets home. One day, he came back from work looking very tired, I confronted him with all the questions I have wanted to ask him. He listened to all my questions but he didn't give any tangible answer. After that, he told me he is going on an official trip to Spain. He said he will be there for two weeks. At that point, I knew that Joseph has started seeing someone else. I started blaming myself for moving in with him. I thought we could have been better if we weren't staying together. If I had stayed back, I wouldn't know if he is cheating or not. At least, my mind will be at rest. On the day of the official trip he claimed he was going, I overheard him talking to a lady on the phone. I didn't hear what he told her but I knew he was talking to a lady. At that point, I decided to take revenge. I had a neighbor who has been eyeing me since I came to the house. He always compliments my dressing. Anytime we meet, he does not forget to tell me how beautiful I am. From the way he talks to me when we meet, I knew that he loves me. I was determined to take revenge on what Joseph was doing to me. On the day he was traveling, I followed him to the airport and made sure he boarded his flight before I left the airport. When I returned home, I went straight to my neighbor's room. I told him that my husband has traveled, so I need someone I could talk to. I said I didn't want to stay in the room alone because it was boring. He went to his fridge and brought me a drink. He was about to return to where he was sitting when I draw him back. I didn't allow him to say anything. I started kissing him roughly. You could see it was what he was craving for with the way he was moaning. He walked me to his bed and we continued until we were all exhausted. Hey, guys, please let me know if this is right or if this is what I should do or please let me have your thoughts on this. I am male, 18, but I love my math teacher. She is 42. Hi, I'm Danny. I am not a popular guy in school until recently. Do not think of me as a loner. No, I am not. I have friends, Jeff, Phil, and Bill. They are the best. The four of us had attending school at the bottom of our preference list until some new teachers were posted to our school to replace the retired ones. That was the time I had a change of view about the school. Do not get ahead of yourself. Academics was not the reason for my sudden change of mind. 
before I tell you about what made me love schooling, it is good to be familiar with my background. I thought I had been living a normal life, even to date not so much had changed. Some people would say I got worse with my weird taste of a woman. I don't care. All I know is that love is in the eyes of the beholder. My full name is Daniel Dawson. I am the second child out of four children of Dawson's family. My father is a pilot. He barely comes home. I wonder how he has the time to be with mum to make us. Even in the festive period, he is either in Italy, Brazil, or one of his weird islands. It is a norm for this family to celebrate Christmas and Thanksgiving without our father. Mum usually defends by saying, he is trying his best, and he is doing all this for the family. How am I supposed to understand that? But I was fine with it anyway. I had only seen my dad physically not more than 20 times, thanks to technology. He now speaks with us regularly either individually or as a family. I remembered when I got my first opportunity with the school basketball team. I shared my achievement with the family and luckily for me, dad got to know. He promised he would be available. I was all optimistic even though I didn't trust him. To be candid, I have never trusted him. How will I trust the person I barely know? On the day of the match, I was aligned with the first team. I looked around for my father. He was nowhere to be found. I was disappointed, even though I was certain he won't come. My mom and my siblings were there to cheer me up. Thank God he didn't even show up. I was awful to the extent that my coach had to sub me off in the first quarter and he never gave me any chance to prove myself again. That goes my hope of becoming a professional basketball player. We lost the match 102-67. I guessed I wasn't the only bad player on the team. My mum is on another level. She was a nurse before she resigned. Only Dave was aware of that. It was immediately after she gave birth to me that she resigned from the health department. She now has her toys store. It sounds like a masculine job but my mum is doing great with this. She told us that she resigned from her job and began the toys selling business because she wanted to be there for us since our father is all busy. That is true. We met everything to her. We stayed at her place after school and we all go home as a family when she is done for the day's work. That had been the norm until we all got to high school. Everyone with his or her own business. We only leave home together but don't come back home as a family. Everyone has now developed their interests. Things are now done individually instead of as a family. My mother tried to return the family to the good old days but it wasn't that easy. We now have something to care about. How bait. We still eat dinner together as a family that is where we share our stories. We know about ourselves at the dining. My two little sisters are the taciturn ones while Dave is so boisterous and expressive. For me, I am just another member of the family. My favorite member of the family is still my mother. I love to open up to her privately. She understands me best compared to anyone else. My elder brother, Dave, is the perfect example of an elderly figure. He is very accommodating and understanding. Unlike the other three of us, he understands dad better. He even develops likeness for some of dad's hobbies. He loves visiting new places just like dad but had vowed not to become a pilot. To him, that is the riskiest job ever and to add to that, it won't be the best available job for a family man. Dave wants to become a pharmaceutical sales rep because of his love for visiting new places. He is currently studying pharmacy at the university. He is a very bright student. He was the best graduating student in his set. He is also the valedictorian and he gave a wonderful speech. I was so proud of him that day. He is not good at sport none of us are. But he is my number one fan even though I suck at basketball. He has no interest in sport but he has never missed any of my games. He is playing his newly found role as a father very well. Besides academics and visiting new places, he is also fond of card tricks. My dad was fond of that too. Both of them spent more time doing card tricks. I don't know much about card tricks but my dad is very good. So is Dave. Dad taught Dave how to go about card tricks and gave Dave his cards but Dave is now on another level in card tricks. While at high school, he had competed at many levels and he had medals to prove for that. He was the regional and national champion before leaving the school. Our school does not only suck at basketball, it sucks in every game. But the only medals we had won from chess and card tricks were all won by Dave. Before leaving high school he was a name to reckon with. Who doesn't know David Dawson? Most people expected me to fit into his shoes when he left high school for college, but soon knew they were thinking highly of me. I am nothing close to him. Even with the wide difference between us, Dave is very proud of his little brother and I am proud of him too. He means a lot to the family. 
I had pharmacy as a strenuous course, yet Dave still had time to check on us and share festive moments with us. He is such a darling. Mum would be proud of that kind of sun coming out of her vagina. I am proud of being the next. My dad had supported his dreams without asking questions. Dave was the luck of the family. Danielle is my immediate younger sister while Dora is the last. Those two are best of friends. They do things together. Funny enough they don't share their feelings with either of our parents. Unlike Dave and I, we shared our feelings with dad and mum respectfully. Those two share their feelings. I am not proud to be called their elder brothers because I don't know anything about the two of them. Danielle is in a relationship with one of my friends, Phil. I didn't buy this idea. I almost fought with Phil but I later got to understand that Danielle like him. I coming between them will do more bad than good. I quit getting between them and focused on helping them nurture a good relationship. I told Phil that if he breaks my sister's heart, I will break his head instead. Scary isn't it? I didn't mean it. I was just buffing. You now right. So far so good. The two are doing well in their relationship. I wanted to know more of what was going in between them but Danielle was not pleased with that action and she is ready to take me up on that. Naturally, Danielle is not a vocal person but in this matter, she threw tantrums and caused some unnecessary scenes. I quickly calmed myself and never interfered in their matter. Dora on the other hand is almost like Danielle but she has an interest in shipwrecks. Dad once asked her what she will like to become. She was not afraid to say, she will like to be a diver. She meant that. She has also been traveling to islands and some other places to see shipwrecks. She had once watched documentaries on shipwrecks for a whole day. She took all her meals in the room that day. No one dares to distract her. She has a do not knock post on her door. I won't lie, and Dora is the most respected individual in the house. You can't just afford to trespass. She had some collections in her room. She had been keeping her weird collections since she was six. Mum was not fine with how things are going with her. Mother wanted her to be more sociable. But Dora is not interested in people. She is more interested in her dirt than in people. The only person that understands her is Danielle. Danielle is a good listener. She is not good with talking, unlike Dave. She barely fights with other people because you don't even know what she is thinking. By so doing Dora sees comfort in her. Me, I am the most confused person in the family. Everyone seems to have one or two things that interest them except me. To make matters worse, I have selected the wrong people as friends. We don't have any plan for our lives. We do things as we are moved based on impulses except for Phil, the businessman. I was the only one to make the basketball team once. The other three can't even throw the ball. They were sent out of training on their first trial. In terms of academics, I wasn't the best either. Dave was a genius while I am just one of those boys in class trying very hard not to repeat a year. My grades aren't too bad but nothing compared to Dave. Most people compared with my brother but even with me trying, I am still not an inch close to him. After several trials, I got confused and I started making mistakes. I made wrong decisions, chose the wrong friends and it got late to make those corrections. Even though I am much better than my friends, I still love their company. Jeff is more like the head of the gang. He gives directives on what we are to do as a team. All his ideas are about crafting things and building stuff. We are not the party kind of person but we are very useful in starting one. We have never hosted any party but we are good at designing and setting up one. Jeff is the ringleader because his mother is an event planner. He sometimes goes to work with his mum to help her. My friends and I are weird to others, but when we went camping with the school we are most respected. Due to our creativity and wide imagination, we make camping interesting. Hunting for games is my favorite event in camps. Jeff, Phil, and Bill have their weirdness. Phil is the business mogul in the gang. As a teenager, he has his own company. He is involved in recycling plastic waste. This was his grandfather's business before he died. He took over from him and had made it more prosperous compared to his grandfather's achievement. Phil was the black sheep of the family until he discovered his part. Phil is my best friend. We have been friends since preschool. Phil and his family are our neighbors. He is the last child of the family and by far the difference. Every person in their family is in the law firm. But Phil hates the white and black gown. He had been trying his best to be unique and different from other members of his family and he is successful. Phil even employed Jeff, Bill, and I into his business as part-time workers. What else can a friend do for you? He even pays us handsomely. Such a nice guy. Since I had stopped going to Mum's toy store to help her, I have been going to his place to earn myself some cash. He is now having intimate affairs with Danielle. I didn't like it at first, but as an elder brother, I want the best for my little sister. 
and more so Danielle doesn't buy the idea of me muddling in her matters since she doesn't interfere with mine. Bill is like a mind suggestion. He is a politician. He had been involved in so many protests in the past, but the one that he did that gained him national recognition was when he protested against the mayor for his lackadaisical attitude towards the School Child Act. He was optimistic about free lunch for all pupils and students at school. He had written letters but they were not attended to. He booked an appointment with Mr. President and poured out his mind to him. Mr. President respected his opinion and asked the mayor to put it in place. I was proud of him. He was given a national award for it. Unlike the rest of us, he is in love with history and books. On average, he reads nothing less than four books in a month, but the sad part is that they are not of academic importance. Most of the books he reads are usually about politics and history. His favorite subject is history. It all began on one fateful afternoon when there was an announcement for all the students to come to the hall. We all get out of our various classes. The hallway was filled up. We could barely walk. All of us were trying to get ahead of ourselves. There was pushing here and there. Jeff whispered into my ears. He had been using the opportunity to pinch people and hit the backside of the ladies. No one caught him. He made me see him hit a lady's buttocks. The lady looked back, looked around but since she didn't notice anything faced her front. We laughed. I joined him in doing the same thing. I was almost caught but this time I gave a straight face as if nothing happened. We eventually got to the hall. Mr. Howard, the principal started speaking to us. He introduced us to a few of our teachers who will be retiring. He spoke so highly of them. My friends and I were not paying attention. We were even playing stone, paper, and scissors. Mr. Albertson, the old geography teacher was awarded as the longest serving teacher in the school history. It is common within the school premises that some of the teachers were once his student. The school choir was allowed to perform. They made a great show. There was a round of applause among the audience. They also sang the school anthem in another lyric. It was a great performance. It caught my attention. As they were rounding up, we saw Mr. Howard showing some strange faces on the way to the podium. Before he started to talk this time, he cleared his throat first. These are your new teachers, he said. They had been transferred here from other schools in the town to replace the retiring ones, he rejoined. Starting from the nearest person to me is Mr. Smith from Onward High, Mr. Johnson from Whitney High School, Mrs. Williams from Maryland High School, and Ms. Brown from Cartersville High. From that moment till the end of the program, my eyes were set on the stage but I wasn't listening anymore. My eyes were set on Ms. Brown. She was the perfect lady that met all I had hoped so in a lady. No other lady had caught my attention in this manner before her. I looked at her and noticed every detail. She had a sculpted figure which was twine thin. Her waist was tapered and she had a burnished complexion. A pair of arched eyebrows looked down on sweeping eyelashes. Her delicate ears framed a button nose. A set of dazzling. Angel white teeth gleamed as she blew gently on her carmine red fingernails. It was a pleasure to see her flowing. Moon shadow black hair. Her enticing, constellation blue eyes gazed at me over her puffy, heart-shaped lips. She felt her lips taste strawberry sweet when even without kissing her. She had a bouncy personality and a sugary voice, which I adored. Not content to be just another drone, she wore a vibrant dress. She's the one. She is the one. She is the one built by God to satisfy me. I kept saying those words to myself. Hey bro, are you not going home? That was Bill. The whole place was almost empty, yet I didn't notice. Ms. Brown and the other new teachers had left the stage. Mr. Howard is nowhere to be found. How come I was still seeing Ms. Brown on the stage? I should have left school for Phil's backyard recycling factory, but I didn't. I left school for a home in a hurry. The first time in a long time, I got home with a smile on my face. It was obvious that I was happy. Danielle and Dora asked me who the lucky girl was. No one, I replied. At the dinner mum just smiled at me. When everyone had gone to sleep, I overheard my mum talking to Dave on the phone. I think he has gotten himself a girl. She was speaking to the other person on the line, whom I assume must be Dave. I lied on my bed. Then there came the next night. I don't know how I got to the countryside, but it was fine since Ms. Brown was there too. The moon's delicate light had just turned the world aflame with silver when I saw her. She had a comely figure which was stem thin. Her curvil in your waist didn't surprise me as much as the saffron tint to her complexion. She must be a native, I thought to myself. Her crescent-shaped eyebrows inclined slightly as she saw me staring at her. I yelped at being caught. Her languid eyelashes of velvet black blinked once slowly as if to invite me over. 
When I came closer, I noticed her scrolled ears and her elegant nose. She nuzzled me with her nose and I couldn't believe it. It was the custom for her people, I reckoned. It was love at first light. Her luminous, heavenly white teeth flashed as she pawed at me with her film star nails. Her hair was a glorious tumble of star bean gold and her virility brown eyes set my heart a thump. Her oxbow lips positively drooled with goodness. Oh, those sugar candy sweet lips, her elegant personality, all mesmerized me. She may not have had a saccharine voice or retro clothes, but what do you expect when two Labrador pups meet in a dog pound? Danny, Danny, Danny. A voice from behind keeps calling my name. The voice sounds familiar but I am enjoying the figure of Ms. Brown in front of me. Then, I felt a cloth leaving my body. I opened my eyes, it was a dream. Oh my gosh, are you not going to school? My mom asked after she succeeded in waking me from sleep. Get yourself cleaned up, get dressed and your food is in the kitchen. She said as she left my room. I was about to stand up from bed when I noticed that my short was wet. Oh no, what the hell just happened? I yelled. I had released. And by the look, if it, this can never be a one-time release. Probably thrice or four times. It was much and noticeable. The bedsheet is sucked already. I can't leave it like this. I stood up from the bed. Took away the blanket and bedspread. Replaced them with a new one. Run to the bathroom to wash up. I spent most of my time brushing my teeth for no reason. I groomed my hair. This time I changed the style. I get dressed in a well-ironed cloth and a shoe to match. Sprayed me and go for my food, then left the house. Normally, I would wait for Bill to knock at our door then join him as we go to school. But today, things were not the same, not even me. Even though I left home without Bill, I still got to school late. Little did I know that he didn't wait for me after knocking at the door several times, or did he? From the school entrance and through the hallway I was the center of attraction. Everyone was gazing at me. I noticed but pretended I didn't. I found my way to my locker to get some of my things then came Laura. Not the most beautiful girl in class. But most people say she is. To me, Elle is far cuter than her. I think it is about how yourself. Exactly what I was doing that day. Hi handsome, said Laura. I looked at her as if I had an interest in her. But the truth is I don't, not at all. Laura, what's up? I asked. There is a party at Luke's place this Friday. If you don't mind, we can go together. She requested of me. Oh, Luke's party. Why won't I want to tag along but I have this thing I want to do. I won't be able to come. I'm sorry. I said as sorry as possible. She sighed. I noticed she was trying to be calm as possible. Okay, what about going to watch a movie with me on Saturday? Then we might spice things up later in the day. He asked of me again. Oh, that too, it is just that. You'll be having something important to do too. She finished my sentence. Exactly, I said scornfully. She hissed and left me there standing. I didn't care about her anyways. I just wanted to see Ms. Brown, that's all. My friends noticed the change and came to me. I would have asked if today is your birthday. But I know you're born in May and this is November. So what is your problem? Ask Jeff. Nothing, I responded. I know you've tried to be cute but I wasn't expecting you to be this good looking said. Bill. Calm down guys nothing is up. I just felt like dressing nice today. I retaliated. It is kike I have been paying you too much. I will have to do reduce your pay by 20%. Phil rejoined. You must be kidding me. I rejoined. So I can't dress well again. That's the problem Bill interrupted. Are you going to see the mayor? Let me help you out. It was tough talking with those guys. They were determined to stress me out. We moved after a long chat that sounds like a police investigation with me. We got to our class and everyone sat on their seat. I was the center of attention in the classroom. I felt like Dave for the first time. I have never felt that kind of attention before until now. I was sitting gently while the whole class wasn't settled. Our class teacher. Mr. Alexis came into the class with Ms. Brown to introduce her as our new math teacher. Here she is, I said to myself. I knew it was wrong fantasizing about my teacher but I can't just help it. My eye was set in her breast. I imagined her being naked then I concentrated on her nipples. I could figure it out with her dress on. I tried to look at her hips. I guess she noticed me looking at her but I don't think she minded. After the introduction, Ms. Brown ran a quick test on us. We submitted and she took the sheets to her office. After a few minutes, she called for me. I got nervous. I did the test very well. Or did I impress her too much? I got to her office. I greeted her and she asked me to have my seat. I sat down and gave my test result. I scored 8 out of 10. What do you think? She asked. I need to buckle up. I replied, knowing for sure that wasn't the right answer. You did well, she said. Then she continued, do you know how old I am? 
28 I presumed. No, you're wrong she said. How old are you? I'm 18 I responded promptly. Okay, you're now legal, isn't it? Yes ma, I responded swallowing my spit. I'm 42 years and I was caught looking at me at the class in an unacceptable manner that is bad of you. Do you find me attractive? She asked. I couldn't say yes, I turned my head repeatedly. She stood up from her chair and sat on the table very close to me. She looked directly into my eyes and said, It is not a bad thing if you like me. I looked at her face and nod my head. She undid a few of her buttons and bent close to me. I could see her big babies. Things are getting tense and I have started getting an erection. No, this is bad. Do you feel like touching them? She kissed me on the lips and whispered to my ears, Keep it a secret. She went back to her seat, sat down, and asked me to leave. What just happened? I could not believe what just happened in there. I left but my mind was not settled. Is this what I think it is? I am attracted to my math teacher. Is she also interested in me or was she just playing with my emotions? Anyways, I will love to squeeze those babies on her chest and penetrate her. Oh, I am thinking that loud. My 17th birthday was just a few days away, and I needed a new pair of shoes to celebrate my birthday. I like ordering items online because they are cheaper. No week passes by that a delivery man wouldn't deliver some goods at my door. But, I wanted to celebrate my birthday with a new shoe. I didn't want to celebrate my birthday in my old shoes. Even though most of the shoes I have, I don't usually wear them. On this fateful day, I was at home doing nothing, so I decided to order a shoe for my 17th birthday. I do not have a lot of friends, therefore, I am planning my birthday myself. I was sitting on the sofa when I heard a knock on my door. When I opened the door, I met a charming-looking young man who came to deliver my order. I couldn't take my eyes off him because of his charming looks. The delivery boy noticed that my eyes were fixated on him, so he didn't want to look at me directly in the eye. Hi, I am Alisa, I introduced myself to him. I was the one that ordered these pairs of shoes online. This time, the delivery boy raised his head and told me that he was aware that I ordered the pair of shoes. He said that was why he is at my door. He handed over the pair of shoes to me and turned back to take his leave. While he was walking towards his bike, I checked the shoe he delivered to me and I noticed that the shoe he brought was not mine. Hey sir, please come back, I quickly called him. When the delivery boy returned to where I was standing, I told him that the shoe he brought was not mine. I told him that I was very sure because the pack looked too small, and I do not believe that my shoe can fit in a small pack like the one you gave to me. The delivery boy came back smiling and told me to wait. Oh, it's another pack. The first pack I gave to you was for my mother, and she ordered a pen or something. The delivery boy collected the shoes he gave me the first time and gave me the original shoe I ordered. I was already having him in her dreams at that time. I was already looking forward to having him in her arms all day long. At this stage, I knew the only way I can have the delivery boy is by inviting him for a coffee. When he handed the shoes to me, I invited him for a coffee but he resisted. After much pressure, he obliged and entered my room. When the delivery boy entered my room, he decided to stand. I was not comfortable with the way he was standing, so I told him to sit on the sofa. When he sat, I sat close to him and started engaging him in a conversation. I quickly excused myself to get him water from the fridge. When I brought the water to him, we continued our conversation. I had already fallen in love with the delivery boy, so I wanted to know everything about him. I thought the best way to start a meaningful conversation with the delivery boy was to ask personal questions. I thought I would be able to persuade him through my speech. I wanted to ask her the first major question. I thought it will be better if I ask about his family first. I know before he answer all my questions, I would get what I wanted. So, tell me about your family background. No sooner than the delivery boy start talking about his family than I excused myself again. This time I quickly went into her bedroom. I changed into a sexier outfit that would attract the delivery boy. When I came out of her bedroom, I noticed that the delivery boy could not stop looking at her cleavages. I started whispering in her mind. I knew I was getting closer to what I wanted. So, I am all ears. Tell me about your family background. I was born into an average family, he said. My mother and my father do menial jobs to support me, my brothers, and my sisters. I have two brothers and a sister. My brother works in a post office as an accountant while my sister works as a hairstylist in a salon. I am the first child of my family, so it means I gave a lot of responsibilities to shoulder. Alisa asked him when he started working as a delivery boy. 
he said I started working as a delivery boy immediately after I left high school. I left high school at the age of 18 and I am 24 years at the moment, which means I have been working as a delivery boy for the past six years. I asked him if he has any plans of going to college. For now, he said I still see myself as a delivery boy, but I am saving up to enroll in college in the next few years. I have always dreamt of becoming a computer engineer since I was a young boy. I would do everything humanly possible to achieve that goal. Oh, I also want to study computer engineering in college too. It seems that we have a lot of things in common. I just graduated from high school and I will want to try other things before I get enrolled in college. My love for the delivery boy continued to increase while I listened to his story. I didn't want the conversation to stop because we were already making eye contact. I want to know about your hobbies. My hobbies are traveling, watching football, reading, watching movies, and listening to music. My love for traveling was one of the reasons I took the delivery job six years ago. I wanted to flow with the conversation and I wanted the delivery boy to believe that we had a lot of things in common, so I told him I also love traveling, even though I am always indoors most of the time. I asked him the countries he has traveled to. To my surprise, the delivery boy said he has never traveled out of the United States. He said he has only traveled to some states in the United States like Florida, Texas, Alabama, and New York. The delivery boy asked me a question for the first time in the conversation. He asked about the countries I have traveled to. Pardon my manners, I pleaded. I said I didn't ask for his name since we started the conversation. He told me his name is Mike. He said he didn't ask for my name because he has already seen my name on the parcel he delivered to me. Now back to the question, I said. I told him I have traveled to the United Kingdom, Spain, France, and Canada. He asked me the reason I traveled to those countries I mentioned. I told him I visited those countries mostly on vacation. You said you like watching football. Which football team is your favorite? He said, although I live in the United States, my favorite football team is Barcelona Football Club. I support the Barcelona Football Club because of Lionel Messi. I do not watch football because I do not like it, Alice said. Even though I see a lot of women playing football nowadays, I still believe it is a men's game. Who knows, I might start supporting Barcelona Football Club because of you. I will be very happy if you do that. You will enjoy watching Barcelona Football Club because they play sexy and attractive football just like you. Did you just say I am sexy? Alisa asked. Yes, you are. The delivery boy replied. At this moment, I knew I was on her way to getting what I wanted but I wanted to take my time. I thought the best way of continuously getting closer to him is to continue the conversation we were having. So you said you like reading, can you tell me about the books you have read? I have read a lot of novels. I have lost count of the number of novels I have read. Although, the majority of the novels I have are romance novels. I just love romance novels. If I may ask, why do you like romance novels? Alice said. I like romance novels because I want to be romantic. I want to be a romantic boyfriend for my girlfriend. I don't want to be a boring boyfriend. That is interesting, Alice said. So, tell me the names of some of the novels you have read. I will like to have them too, I said. I also want to learn how to be romantic. If that is the case, I will help you bring a lot of romance novels that I have. Do not stress yourself by going to the bookshop, the delivery boy said. I got up and embraced the delivery boy. She said she was very happy with his kind gesture. After the hug, I returned to where I was sitting. This time, I moved closer to Mike again. You said you like movies too, so, tell me the movies you have watched. I was more interested in this movie aspect because I am a lover of movies too. Most times when I am in my room, I am always watching movies. I like comedy movies, the delivery boy said. I love movies that make me laugh and take off the daily stress that I have passed through at work. So, tell me your type of movies too, the delivery boy asked. Alice said, I love romantic movies a lot. Alice replied, The same way you said you have lost count on the number of books you have read, is the same way I have lost count on the number of romantic movies I have watched, Alice told the delivery boy. I like romance movies because they are always lengthy. I like romantic movies too, Mike said. I do not watch them because they are very lengthy, and it takes a lot of time to watch. You know I am a very busy man, so it will be difficult for me to watch lengthy movies, Mike said. That is the reason I love short comic movies. I can watch them within a few hours, and they help me relax well as I said before. 
Alias said she will want Mike to follow her to the cinema very soon. Mike obliged and promised to follow her to the cinema when he is off duty. Alias couldn't contain her joy when Mike told her he will follow her to the cinema. She said she can't wait to go and have a nice time at the cinema with him. Now, let us talk about your music taste, Alyssa said. Tell me the types of songs you listen to and your favorite artists. I am a big fan of R&B songs. I like songs that are slow and have strong lyrical content. I was smiling after Mike's explanation. So tell me who your favorite artists are. I am a big fan of Chris Brown and R. Kelly, Mike said. I told Mike that I want us to play a game. I told him that I want to know if he is a big fan of the artists he mentioned. I told him that I want him to list 10 songs of the artists he mentioned as his favorite. Mike laughed and he started listing it. Mike said he will start with R. Kelly. Mike said some of R. Kelly's songs that he knows are I Believe I Can Fly, The Same Girl, It Seems That You Are Ready, I'm a Flirt, Down Low, Trapped in the Closet, If I Could Turn Back the Hands of Time, Fiesta, Sex Planet, I Wish, You Remind Me of Something and Half on a Baby. I was wowed as Mike continued to list R. Kelly's songs. I am surprised, Alyssa said. But you have to list Chris Brown's songs too for you to win the game. Mike nodded his head and kept smiling. Mike said some of Chris Brown's songs that he knows are forever, Blow My Mind, Undecided, Don't Wake Me Up, Track Star, Run It, Take You Down, New Flame, Under the Influence, Loyal, No Guidance, and Go Crazy. You won. Now I agree that you are a big R&B fan and you are also a fan of Chris Brown and R. Kelly. Mike also returned the gesture. So, tell me your type of music and your favorite artist too, Mike said. I told him I love R&B songs too. Mike asked who my favorite artists are. I told him I like Celine Dion, Rihanna, and Beyonce. Mike told me that I should also mention 10 songs of these artists I mentioned. I said so you want me to mention 10 songs because I asked you to mention 10 songs. I said, okay, I accept the challenge. I started with Celine Dion. I said some of Celine Dion's songs that she knows or my heart will go on. I surrender, it's all coming back to me now, all by myself, the power of love, to love you more, I'm alive, have you ever been in love, ashes, a new day has come, beauty and the beast, and just walk away. I told him that some of Rahana's songs that she knows are umbrella, diamonds, we found love, love on the brain, the monster, don't stop the music, only girl, desperado, work, rudaboy, needed me, pour it up, towards the sun, and man down. Lastly, I said some of Beyonce's songs that I know are Say My Name, Crazy in Love, Countdown, Run the World, Irreplaceable, Love on Top, Formation, Brown Eyes, Naughty Girl, Beautiful Liar, Partition, and Dance for You. Mike clapped as Alyssa kept listing the songs. They both laughed and applauded each other. In a bid to continue the conversation, I asked Mike about the things he likes and the things he dislikes. He said he liked people that are honest, truthful, hardworking, and open-minded. He said he hates laziness, dishonesty, and lies. When he finished talking about his likes, he asked me about my likes and dislikes too. I said I like almost everything he said he likes and dislikes. I told Mike that I was not wrong the other time when I said that we have a lot of things in common. I said it's difficult to believe that we can have so much in common on meeting for the first time. Why did you say you hate dishonesty? Has anyone broken your heart before? He said he used to have a girlfriend when he was in high school. He said we were in the same class and he loved her very much. He said she started acting the other way when they left school. He said she started ignoring his calls, and she was caring as she was when they were in college. He said at that point, he knew someone else has snatched her from him. He said he had no other option than to break up with her. He said it was very painful because she was the first girl he would ever fall in love with. Oh, that's said, Alice said. It's all right. Mike replied. So, did you date anyone else after she broke up with you? I asked Mike. Mike said he hasn't gone into a relationship since then. He said he has been focused on his work and his family. He said he doesn't want another distraction. So you mean women are a distraction, I said. Mike said some women are a distraction because they are not honest. He said they wouldn't love a man the way he loves them. He said there are also many other reasons why he has decided to stay away from having a relationship. Alyssa said she wants to know the reasons. Mike said he just wants to concentrate on his job and his family. He said he wants to be able to save up so that he can achieve his aim of becoming a computer engineer. Alyssa said wow, that's fine. She asked Mike if he would consider going into a relationship if he finds someone that is honest. Mike said it's a probability. 
tell me about your love life too, Mike asked me. I have never been into a relationship deeply like you. I had a very close friend in high school that people used to think we were dating. We were very close but we were not in any relationship. At that point, I knew had Mike where I wanted him. I knew I could do anything I wanted with him, but I wanted to take her time and see where the conversation will lead to. So, how have you been coping since you broke up with your girlfriend? Mike said I have been coping well. Mike understood what I meant by the question. He knew I wanted to ask if he has been having sex since he left his girlfriend but he decided to play along. He wanted me to say it directly. I know he has been coping well. But, how has he been coping with lack of sex or does he have a sex partner? Mike smiled. He was happy because he heard what he wanted to hear from me. Mike said he doesn't have a sex partner. He said he has been able to stay away from sex since he and his girlfriend broke up. I smiled and told Mike that I admire his courage. I said it's not easy to stay away from sex that long especially having sex before. Mike also wanted to know about my sex life. Tell me if you have ever had sex before. Mike said since I said she hasn't had a deep relationship, he was curious to know if I have gotten down with someone. I said I have gotten down many times with my high school friend even though we weren't dating. I excused myself to get a drink for Mike. At that stage, both Mike and I were already in the mood to get down with each other. When I got up, Mike couldn't take his eyes off me as I walked to the kitchen. I realized that Mike's eyes were fixated on me, so I started walking seductively to draw Mike's attention. When I entered the kitchen, Mike thought to himself that that was the perfect opportunity, he needed to have sex with me. I picked a drink from the fridge and went to the kitchen to pick a cup. While I was walking to the kitchen, Mark stood up and trailed me. He stood at my back but I did not know because I was pouring iced teas into a cup. While I was pouring iced tea into the cup, I felt Mike near me grabbing my butt. I knew it was Mike because we were the only ones in the house. I deliberately acted like I didn't know someone was at my back grabbing my butt I was already in the mood, and I was enjoying what Mike was doing. Mike continued grabbing my butt. He was waiting for me to turn to him so that he could plant a kiss on my mouth. Immediately I turned back to see who was at my back. Mike planted a kiss on my mouth and smiled at me. At that stage, Mike and I were deep into each other. I pecked him many times in the kitchen, and he pecked me too. We continued to peck each other because we wanted to keep things simple. I led Mike back to my room and we continued our conversation. My conversation with Mike became more intimate. I was wrapped up in his arms while I continued to chat with him about his private life. Mike wouldn't talk for two minutes without giving a peck, and I was always ready to receive his peck. After about three hours of chatting and pecking, Mike told me he was leaving. He said his family would be waiting for him. I followed him to my gate and we kissed for the last time. It was an awesome experience for me. Since then, I have ordered more than six items. Most of the items are items that I do not need. I kept on ordering these items with the hope that Mike will be the one to deliver them. Six months after, I have not been able to see Mike. I want someone to help me look for him. Someone to help me look for him. Someone to help me look for Hi, I'm Stacy. I have lived alone with my mom since my sister went to college a few years back. I never knew my dad, all my memories of him were from pictures or what I was told about him. I really didn't mind, my sister was my whole word before she left for college. Recently, I have had problems with boys. No guy wanted to date me for a week at the most. The guys just wanted to get intimate with me and ditch me. At first, I thought I was the one ditching them. But now I realized I was the one being played. I couldn't take this anymore. I demanded a change, and I am trying to fix things at all costs. Things shouldn't continue like this. This is my story. This is how it began. I was the hottest girl in school. I dated as many guys as I wanted. Or should I say the guys dated me long enough as they wanted. I thought it was all about me until I realized. I wanted to make my sister's version of high school for myself. My sister, Brielle, was my best friend. She was only because she filled my head with how he dated a guy and ditched him. How another became a crybaby because of her. How Vic knelt down in the dome just to go watch a movie with her. And some other cool stuff. Don't be deceived, Brielle is way better than me. My mum said she took after our aunt, who lives in Dallas. 
I am just my mum's daughter. Even though I possess more prominent curves, both hind and rare, Brielle is still a babe to behold. I would have taken all her stories to be myths, but they were evident. Most of the time, when mum was off to the office, Brielle came home with different guys, and she didn't repeat one twice, never except for Drew. I could tell the reason myself, that guy was huge and muscular. Maybe he hit the gym regularly because the packs on his abdomen are well packed. Drew is the kind of guy every woman fantasizes about. Right from grade eight, I had been planning myself to achieve more than Brielle. She was my role model, but I wanted to reset the pace. It went well, just as I had planned, and I can tell I learned from the best. Brielle was damn good. I started with Stuart. Stuart was just the kind of guy you can call the victim of everyone. Straightforward to prey on. That day was my day to be a predator. And lo, the perfect target had started eyeing me. It was easy for me to find out this boy would die to find his way into me. I noticed this. Yet I was playing hard to get. I did winkle at him whenever I caught him staring but he was one of those boys who really needed a motivational speaker to kill a cockroach. He was my perfect victim, and I was waiting like a cat at the end of the hole to devour the rat. We were at Hudson's party that night. Hudson wasn't really celebrating anything. In fact, no one knew his birthday because he throws a party every Friday. All Hudson needs to throw a party is his parents absent from home. I was trying to get a cocktail glass when I caught Stuart sitting on the sofa behind me. He was busy gazing at my behind while his friends were doing the talking. I don't think Stuart was really interested in the discussion. He saw himself in me. Who won't want to get their hands on those vast backsides? You can't blame the innocent boy. Who doesn't know the kind of problem he was about to get into. I winkled at him as I usually do and I was moving from the living room towards the direction of the rooms. I looked back to see if he would follow, but he was resting his back on the sofa and his friend saying things to his head this time. He got up and walked in my direction. Finally, he had been motivated. He followed me and took all the corners I took. He bumped onto me, he said sorry and started shaking in his voice. I placed my hand on his head to calm his nerve. I know you like me, I whispered to his ear. I put his hands on my chest. He couldn't believe what was happening. I squeezed his hand on my chest. He looked at my face in astonishment. I bit the corner of my lips. His hands were vibrating on my chest. I opened the door and dragged him in while I gave him the kiss of his life. I could depict that he was a novice. But I played along nicely. That was what I had been doing since. Acting. I lay on the bed and encouraged him to come over to me. Before we started the scene, the lucky man got lucky earlier than expected. I smiled, I wasn't really interested in him. I was just teasing him. And the little guy fell for the awaiting bait. Before noticing my smile, I pushed him off me and gave him a straight face making him uncomfortable. He pleaded for the release earlier. I could tell the guy was disappointed, but who cares? Right. I found my way out of the room and smashed the door behind me, proving that I was really angry with him. He jumped after me and pulled my hand from behind. And apologized. I didn't consider his apology a bit. Give me another chance, please. This time you won't be disappointed, he pleaded. Yes, he fell for the next trap. I said to myself. Okay, no problem. I snapped. I dragged him to the dance floor downstairs. I purposely stayed in the middle of the stage to call for attention which I got. I placed Stuart's hands on my buttocks and added pressure on the hand so that he could squeeze those cheeks. Stuart raised up his head, feeling he was on top of the world. After a while, I perceived his hand vibrating on my buttock. I turned around, positioned my buttock between his two legs, and placed his hand over my chest. 
we dance to the loud music. I increase the intensity by stroking up and down on his laps with my backside. Within a few minutes, and can feel his wet pant on my mini skirt. I turned around at once. What is the meaning of this? I said aggressively. Everyone looked at us and quickly found out what had happened. Everyone started laughing at Stuart. He was ashamed of himself and ran out of the party, trying not to cry. I had a bizarre smile on my face. One down, many more to go, I said to myself. I watched him leave and continued dancing. I got the attention I needed that night. I knew I had laid the first brick. And now it would be easier for me to catch more fish in my cunny net. I didn't tell my sister on the phone about the news. I wanted to be perfect before proclaiming myself. On my checklist of naughtiness, the next and most preferential thing to do is change my friends. I needed to start walking with the most incredible, hottest, and sweetest girls in school. I was not a fan of doing things gradually. I wanted to move with the speed of a power horse. Had I known, I would have taken the stairs instead of the elevator. The second day at school, I was a different Stacy. My friends couldn't understand, so they left me alone with my madness. I caught the attention of everyone, even Mr. Collins, the history teacher, who won't fall for the girl that purposely walked within the school premises like Lady Gaga with the shape of Angelina Jolie and the face of Nicki Minaj. The focus of the school just changed from outstanding academic records to having an intimidating moment with me. Hello, girly, a voice standing next to my desk said. I knew that voice was Britney's, the head of the Beatles, a group that had been terrorizing the school with their stony beauty. Hi, Britney, I said with the sweetest voice possible. I raised my head to look at her face. She handed me a sheet of paper and left. That's normal, what else did I know Britney for? She's rude. I opened the article to read what was written. Atlas Corner. Cinema Stall Room, 4 p.m., Don't Be Late, Love from Brittany, was written jaggedly on the piece of paper. I grinned a little. Yes, I said to myself. Mission accomplished. I could not concentrate any more in class. I was eager to meet my new friend. The Beatles. I get on rationalizing how the crew will start doing things with me involved. The numbers of boys that will ask me out in a day. The guys I will pretend I am interested in just to embarrass them. And so many other naughty and rude kinds of stuff finding their feet in my mind. I tried getting them away from my mind. But they remained stalked. Since I could not help it, I kept on enjoying the fantasy. Immediately I heard the bell. I took my things, trying hard not to rush since that was my usual self. I got my bag, this time. I had a handbag instead of the typical scotch bag. I headed straight to the cinema stall room behind the theater. I followed Brittany's direction by heart. I got to the meeting point. I never knew that place could be that dark and dusty. I saw the light at the end of the little passage. I walked through different artistries to the light. And I tried not to drop anything, which would have been a mess. I got to where I saw the ray. Behold, Lucy and Pinky. Those two were a pain in the ass, so annoying and disrespectful. I checked my wristwatch. It was 3.52 p.m. Wow. I didn't get late to my induction party. I whispered to myself. Hello, ladies, I greeted the two girls. They did not respond nor show any gesture. It was as if I was not there. The two girls glued their faces on their phones and kept laughing and talking. Those two are good at keeping each other's company. Since I had been ideally ignored, I got myself a wooden box and made myself comfortable. Pinky looked at me as if she would say something impish, but instead continued with her gist. I brought out my phone and started checking my emails. That wasn't necessary because I wanted to well away the time while I longed for the arrival of Brittany. Finally, Brittany showed up. I checked my time to know the exact time. 
It was 4 p.m. on the dot. God, the girl, is punctual. At last, she got that virtue. She wasn't all bad anyway. Before I could stand to greet her, the two older girls surrounded her and took a few shots with their phones. After the supposed greeting, she introduced me to the group. That was really unnecessary since we were all classmates, but I played along with it anyways. Will you like to be a beetle? Brittany asked. I was shocked with nothing to say, but inside I was euphonious. I tried to be the tough girl they thought I was. You're wasting time asking me. I'm here already. Brittany smiled beautifully. I like this girl, she said while pointing her index finger towards me. Straight away, the two other girls started talking to me. They told me unique pieces of stuff. I wasn't intrigued, nor was I surprised by their sudden change of attitude. It was acting. And I know for sure that I just got enrolled into the school of acting. The girls helped me with all my social media accounts. Posted my picture everywhere. I took a couple of photos later uploaded. And boom, my followers started increasing. I couldn't believe that. It was as if the followers had been waiting for that moment to come to their whole life. I was introduced to some rules on how to operate flawlessly in the group. The regulations, in summary, be rude and naughty. Isn't that why I took the appointment? Life just got more straightforward or rather terrible. Only time will tell. Everything was going according to plan. I now walked with the most popular group in school and dated some big boys. The one for me was that I became the most sought after in school just a few weeks after joining the Beatles. Lucy and Pinky were getting jealous, but couldn't do much since Brittany was okay with it. I knew but didn't care. For me, I am yet to achieve my goal. No one had knelt down for me yet. Within a month after my induction, I started going out with Frank. Frank was from a wealthy family. I never knew his old man, but I heard the man is the chief executive officer of a tech company. Well, without doubt. I believe because Frank did brag about his father's achievement. All he had of himself were gargets and more gargets. The relationship was so dull. The guy was just too direct. All he thinks of is what lies under my panties. Such a naughty dude. I managed to play along with the supposed relationship. Frank had so much luxury stuff and went out with rich kids like him. He was fond of me, he showed me off to his friends every time as if I was a priceless antique to be auctioned. Though he was proud, this dude knows how to spoil a lady. I made sure my mum didn't know about my relationship with Frank. She wouldn't have supported the union. Frankly speaking, what kind of single mum will help such? Her ignorant is the best for me. I had more mischievous plans to pull. Frank had a party with his wealthy friends and decided to take me along one of those days. I saw this as a significant opportunity to pull the ditching string. I told my mum that I would be sleeping over in my friend's place. She agreed. I took off one of my beautiful dresses and a heel to match. And off I went. I stopped at Brittany's place to change into the gown. I called Frank and told him to come and pick me at Brittany's home. A few hours had gone, and finally, the lover boy showed up. I exchanged kisses and told him that Brittany would love to tag along with us. I made that up because I knew what Brittany was capable of. No problem, he said. While Brittany was getting changed, Frank and I were in the living room sharing a romantic moment. Brittany came down from her room. She caught us in the moment, she coughed, and the two of us detached in a hurry. Frank led us to a black limo waiting outside Brittany's house. Inside the limo, Frank was actually a pompous host. I didn't mind because he is notorious for that. Brittany, on the other hand, was just present physically. Since Frank handed her a glass of champagne, she had been with her phone. Sometimes it looks like that is her real world. And here it is, virtual. Frank and I tried to make chemistry. But it wasn't perfect since the two of us had a different reason for dating each other. 
and love is omitted. I was dating him because he is rich and famous. And I needed such a feat to prove myself in this new game I play. Frank was dating me because he just wanted to show his friends that he could catch big fish. The limo stopped at the entrance of a five-star hotel. The driver opened the door with Brittany steeping out first. Then Frank, who helped me by taking my hands. It was like a fairy tale. So, many reporters were present. There were camera flashes everywhere. Brittany was eager to face the crowd to earn more popularity while Frank waved at them. But I was able to hide my face perfectly. My mum mustn't see such things. It was a grand entry to be candid. I met several children of vibrant personnel in the state. Every person was VIP. The first time I enjoyed such a feat. Everything was going on smoothly. Brittany had succeeded in entangling herself with another boy. She disappeared with the new guy. I guessed someone went to get dirty. I couldn't do much. I purposely made sure Brittany was here so that I could pull a perfect trick. But now she's nowhere to be found. Actually, I enjoyed myself. It was an elaborate get-together. I got everything I never tasted by just demanding. The party was going on fine while I was looking for an opportunity to create a scene. Finally, Brittany was back in the room. And Frank was busy chatting with his friends about their most expensive possession. How is that a discussion? I really didn't fit in too much. But Brittany fitted in perfectly. The girl is Tiffany in the making. Such a good actress I must oblige. The moment had finally come. I saw a glass of red wine with Frank. He was about to turn back when I rushed towards him making him spill the wine on the silver white dress I wore. What have you done? I retorted. It was a perfect first attack. He tried to draw me away from his friends and pleaded with me for the spillage. I pushed him back. You ruined my dress. I shouted at him. Still trying to avoid the disgraceful moment. He wanted to draw me from the crowd. I slapped him, where did that boldness come from? I couldn't believe I could do that. I was terrified within me, but yet every bit of my plan was coming to play in the perfect order. Just the way I wanted it. Brittany, doing what she knew how to do best, had started live streaming. Then the rich man's kid apologized. I am very sorry, I didn't mean to spill the wine on your dress. You should understand that it was an accident. Accident. I ruined my dress and you said it was an accident, I barked. The rich kid went down on his knees and apologized. I got a glass of wine and poured the content on him. I regretted the action immediately. But the awesomeness on Brittany's face comforted me. Brittany and I left the party to her place. She praised me as if I had just conquered a gladiator. I wasn't pleased with myself. Who does that? Brittany was full of my praise. Before I saw the video myself, she had uploaded it. I later found out when browsing with her personal computer later that night. To my surprise, so many people had shared it. I got to school. I looked around for Frank, though I wasn't planning to apologize. I just wanted to see him for no reason whatsoever. I could not find him anywhere. I couldn't send a call through. Hudson later blew the news. He had left the city for another country. At that moment, I knew that it was a game over. Times passed, then came Brad. Brad was a transfer student from another city. This boy was the kind of boy mama would be proud of. He looked older than his age. But after some research, the rest of the Beatles and I found out he is just 17. No, this can't be the truth. The guy looked so mature. Within the first few weeks in school, several girls had fought because of him. The Beatles were also in incoherence on this case. That will be the first time as far as I could recall. Every hot babe demands a hot guy, I guess. For the first in forever, Lucy, Pinky, and Brittany fought and never reconciled. I was still a great associate to Brittany while Lucy and Pinky enjoyed each other company. 
I wasn't interested in this guy because of his insane popularity. But having him for myself will significantly benefit me. It would increase my charm by miles. Hello babe, that was Brittany by my desk. Everyone now sees us as best pals. Brittany was not to be trusted. That babe was a big snitch. She told me she approached Brad how she felt about him and Brad turned down her approach. I want revenge, she said. Well, that's what I was good at. No problem, I replied. I knew I was irresistible. Every high school can't afford to lose me once they are opportune. I started walking towards Brad. I wanted him to notice me, but frankly, the guy was tough. Later he fell. One afternoon, we met at the dome one afternoon. He bumped onto me accidentally. And my science project fell. He picked up the pieces and reassembled them as quickly as he could go. I was impressed. Can you have a cup of coffee with me? If you don't mind. I asked of him. I would rather have a bottle of beer with you at a bar. He responded. I smiled, I like this kind of guy. So, a date it is. I rejoined. We said our bye-byes. And the two of us went our separate ways. I chatted up Brittany immediately. She was amazed. And she drew her plan, it was a perfect plan and would make this big guy have a significant fall. Brittany is undoubtedly next to the devil in deeds. After the chat, I started having missed feelings. I wasn't so sure, but it was like I was beginning to like this dude. Brad is handsome, and to my experience, he is far from how Brittany described him. And everyone knows is that when Brittany said it is raining outside, you need to go and check for yourself. I decided to take note of this guy to see for myself. On Friday, Brad and I finally met at a bar to take some beers. The bartender didn't bother to ask for our age, judging by Brad's enormous stature. We got ourselves an empty sight and yakked away the whole time. The boy was amusing to be with. I got drunk, don't judge me. I don't drink. He got us a taxi and took me home. Most guys would have taken advantage of me that night. But he didn't. He dropped me at the door and introduced himself to my mum. I slept off on the couch. The following day was a weekend. I woke at noon. My mum gave me a spicy soup to drink. I took it. I was damn hungry. She set the table for lunch. And while we were taking the meal, most of the dining discussion was about Brad. It seemed my mum liked him. And so was I for the first time, I can say I am really interested in someone. Later that day, I called my sister. We chatted a lot. She told me that mum had told her about the whole thing. We both laughed about it. I said about the association between the Beatles and me and how we separated. She advised me to detach myself from such friendship. I knew she was right, and she was speaking from experience. But, I had gone deep into these things. I didn't know how to call it short anymore. Brad and I started seeing each other frequently. You could tell something was going on between the two of us but there had not been any official proposal. So, friends are the best you could call this kind of thing. And for a while, I had not been on talking terms with Brittany. We were not in disagreement but just that we can't agree on a thing anymore. I started walking with my old friends. They had been waiting for me to get myself out of the madness I was in. You could tell that Brielle talked some sense into me. Brittany had noticed my lack of cooperation. And she had reconciled with the old Beatles members. Things just got worse for my companies and me. It was apparent that Brad only wanted to be a friend since his girlfriend regularly visited him from his previous school. I wasn't bothered, my friendship with him was worthwhile. Brittany tried to get to Brad, trying all her cunny moves. But I did give Brad a head start in the game. You could call me a snitch. It is fine, I am tired of seeing people get hurt. Most guys later found out that Brad and I were just friends. The long-awaiting suitors started coming up with their approaches. 
This time I was unnecessarily rude as I was. I realized I had been a bad bitch for so long, and many had been said about me. A lot of good people had been avoiding me, and I didn't notice. I was blindfolded by the things Brittany fed me with. My goal was to be popular and nothing more. I picked up so many lousy virtues on my way to fame. And my sister came out to be nicer than I taught. I was so much ashamed of the past few months. I received a few proposals and ignored the others. But none lasted for a month, with some lasting just a few days. I could get entangled with a guy today and tomorrow. He is no more interested in me. I was so much in need of a guy I could call my boyfriend, but to no avail. It was as if there was a famine of boys. No one lasted for at least a month. My hunt for a boyfriend increased. I refused to turn down people's approaches, but all ended within a short while. I told Brielle about this, she couldn't devise a means to solve the problem. I guessed she didn't know all too. I took up the courage to speak with Brad since we were good friends. I asked him what guys wanted in ladies. He couldn't give me a straight answer too. Even Stuart came knocking at the door again. This time, it looked like a payback. He ditched me before I even fell in love with him. What the hell is happening to me? It was as if the whole school planned to get back at me for my evil deeds. I needed a drastic change. I wanted things to go back to when I was that innocent beauty. I tried to redeem myself. Who am I to meet? Who is the head of these, or the whole school is just acting on this simultaneously? I could not figure out anything. I was confused. Who is behind all these? The Beatles and I had parted ways for a while now. We don't really exchange greetings. I really don't bother at first until recently. I had started thinking if they were involved in the dismay. This is what the group of girls is known for. And this is what they do best. They are better at tarnishing images than doing well in school. I started suspecting their moves and began to keep tags on them. Hunting them with their own skills. After several weeks of monitoring their movements, I could not take them red-handed even though all accusing fingers pointed at them. I started checking on my friends after a failed attempt on the beetle. They weren't shady, to be candid, but I didn't want to leave any stone unturned. Checking on them is really convenient since we are always together, but I can't predict their actions once they get home. I made it a habit to sleep periodically at their place. Even though they stayed up at night, it wasn't a reason to call the accused. After another futile effort, I thought of Brad. Can Brad stoop so low to that level? I don't know who to trust and who not to. I began another investigating job on him. I could tell the guy noticed my motive but did not care since he didn't find any reason for me to do that. For sure, he is not the one, but since he knows about what is going on, he is still a suspect but not prime. Brielle is the next on my list. She is miles away from home, but I can't afford to get her off the list. She called me more often than she did in the past. We shared more moments together and chatted a lot about our lives. Some about her school life and maybe fashion and some girls talk. Things were smoother betwixt us. She had been my best friend in the past, but now I think she can make something up. But wait, why will she want to do me any harm? What will she gain from that? I am her little sister. And she is my whole world. Even if I tried to pop my nose in her matters. I could not do that well since she barely came home. She only comes on holiday. I don't know what to do and who to hold the victim. I don't like this period. I want to disappear from the surface of the earth before I become the laughingstock at school. Who can be involved in this evil act? Can it be the Beatles? My friends, Brad or Brielle? What do you think? You think? You think? You think? You think?